<laughs> Welcome to the show. I'm James. I'm David. I'm Riley. And today, yes, today, uh, today, we are covering the sequel to perhaps the greatest hard sci-fi epic that this generation has the privilege of coming out during its lifetime. It's Dune 2. I don't know if it's hard sci-fi, but continue. Don't question the grammar either. Uh, <laughs> we'll laugh. We'll cry. We'll argue. I don't think I say cry normally. <laughs> we might get a little too into it, but at the end of the day, they're just movies. We'll complain. Spoiler alert. All right, man, we have... <laughs> Welcome back, it's, everybody. It's been how long? Two years? Two, two years? Over two years. December 2022. No. Yeah. No. To three to and three. a bit. A year and a bit? It's only been a year and a bit. It's hard to do the math when it's at the end of the year, you know? Mm. It feels like two years. I, it does. You know, when we shot the episode one, we didn't know if there would be a part two to Dune. It wasn't greenlit. It's true. It's true. Yeah. They didn't commit. They and were like waiting until, the, waiting to see how the first one did. And that's all that's passed since then. They, they greenlit it. They made it. They delayed it because of the strike. And then it fucking came out and we saw it. Hell yeah, we did. Moments ago and we haven't spoken to each other to the extent that I even have your impressions yet. This is so no, raw. I know, I haven't yeah. spoken to you in two years. Since the last podcast, <laughs> this is what you're saying, right? It hasn't been two years. <laughs> <laughs> it's only been like a year and three months or something. Four months. David, what are you giving this movie out of ten? Uh... All right. <laughs> Slogans, that's what we do next. Right. But you don't have a slogan. The Denis Villeneuve's strength is not in words, oh. but by assembling the greatest masters in every craft of mm. filmmaking, he has made the movie that Dune 1 wished it could be. Are you calling him like an Edison or Elon Musk figure? The movie that Dune 1 <laughs> wished it could be? Yeah. It, this what? has the thing that Dune 1 was missing, oh. which is heart. You said okay. that in the, I listened to the first episode yeah. a little bit and you said that. Yeah, I found the first movie very cold. I right, we'll get into it. Overall, fucking fantastic. Mm. This is a incredible movie. Let's go. We're pretty high off this movie. Uh I'm high nines, like 9.5, 9.6, man. This thing is awesome. Heck yeah. Let's go. <laughs> Lots more fighting. Um That's why I like you. Yeah. <laughs> they punch each other. I think I generally I think I generally agree with that. I think that like the the sound design sound design, production design, acting, like writing, uh music, uh, it was all just like top notch. And uh yeah, there's some kind of interesting changes they made to the plot, mm. but overall I feel like this is about as excellent as I could have hoped for it to be. Uh, I gave the first one a 9 out of 10. I'm giving this one a 9 out of 10 as well, because I don't give them... I don't really do the decimals Points? as much. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Why? What are you going to give it a 9 I don't, rem I don't remember, I but didn't, didn't you give like Spider-Man 2? Like Spider-Verse 2? Oh, wait, we never covered that. What, I have to give it more than a 9? Didn't nine? you give something else like a way higher than that? I'll give this a 9.4. Don't, don't, you always let us pressure you. Yeah, you always change your numbers. I just want you to be That's happy, James. Riley. <laughs> <laughs> I just want James to, to be happy with me. Migo. Dune 2 is, the, Migo. <laughs> is not only the best movie I've seen since D Dune 1. It's the best movie I've seen since the last movie I watched that I gave a 10 on this podcast. And then herein lies the dilemma. Hmm. Mm. Since I gave Blade Runner 2049 a 10, and I liked this movie more, does that mean it's a goddamn 11? That's why you can't give tense. What? However, Why you? however, simultaneously, it wasn't perfect. I mm -hmm. have some nitpicks. Yeah. Therefore, it must be less than 10. So is it an 11 or is it a 9.9? At this point, it doesn't freaking matter. It's a, it's a sick, sick movie. It's fantastic. It's I think I still liked the first one more. What? I don't think so. What do you, you don't think I don't, that I did? I don't think you did, <laughs> Riley. And that's what I, what I set out to convince Riley of tonight. That's my thesis. <laughs> he didn't like it less. I'm going to see it again. I already have like plans to see it again. You have a cold. You're not yourself. I know. You're not, he's not thinking clearly. I know. I, it was hard for me to like get stoked, I think. I mean, I have been stoked. It's almost like I'm burned out from being stoked oh, for this movie. Oh. See, you know? I insulated myself. I didn't think about it too much. I never watched the trailer in full. Yeah. I didn't talk to people. I didn't see the impressions. I did the same thing. I, I kept my hype level low. Oh, I didn't look past I mean, my expectations. I saw some, you know, stuff pop up on Google News or whatever where it's like, oh, the critics like it or, or whatever. But I think I was like, I, it was so hard to imagine a world in which this one was not good. It would. It's hard, though, because love and hate are, you know, so close. They're divided by, you know, paper thin line. Mm. And sometimes things that are great just flip that switch for me and I just hate it. Mm. Not this. From the beginning of this movie, I was hooked. I think I know what you mean because for something to be 
to really push the to be truly beautiful and artful, it has to push some boundary mm -hmm. that that just means it's going to turn some people off. Absolutely. I just feel like the first one had a slightly greater focus. Like it was like mm. it was. I don't even know. I think it was. I think it was just that having that open endedness kind of let me let let the story finish in a slightly more satisfying way. Interesting. It is interesting, but I don't think this is where we should begin this discussion. Oh sure, fine. Where, where do you want to go? <laughs> well, I, uh, it's hard. Where do you start? But I think one place we could start is I think where we started before, which is the production design. Oh, and yeah. the reason I think it's a good place to start is because you're sitting back and like you know get into that chair. And you see the production design, mm. you see what the world looks like, and you're like, oh, yeah, we're back on Arrakis. Yeah. Like, when, they, when they showed a, more close-ups in this movie of the Harkin and Soldier suits. So cool. We see them in the desert. We see this kind of, like, vent on the back of its suit that's circular. But around the circumference of the vent is these little, like, teeth-looking spikes. Yeah. It's yeah. like, how does a vent look Harkonnen? Yeah. It's <laughs> so sick. I, Yeah. I, I will say that like the in terms of adapting the visuals and the and the vibe of of the book, like this is what I said in the first in the, when we did the first one. This it was exactly what I imagined. Like mm. like it's it's not, I don't think I imagined what I saw on the screen or whatever. But when I saw what on the like what I saw on the screen, I was like, this is this is perfect. Like this is they have done such a good job, and I think that. It, I, it, it is surprising to me how that that something could be adapted this well outside of like Lord of the Rings. I've mm. I made that comparison in the last one. I think it still stands. Well, one of the things I think is really interesting is the choice of colors in the movie. It's a very mm. muted palette, but I love that like on Arrakis, there's almost no pure black except the Harkonnen. So every time you mm. see their suit, they like they are this force of darkness, like this visual, you know, almost like just like, like this, a soul sucking like hole. a soul sucking like hole. a drain and I, I think that it's it's a strong thing they just feel so out of place not just from color but their shapes too like they they're so alien on that planet compared to the Freckens the Fremen, Fremen. and look Fremen. how look how the Harkonnen <laughs> move they move they move yeah. like so stiffly oh right God, but whereas the Fremen are, are sand walking they're like the, dancing they do just such great design choices too I'm sure it's in the book but like when they're like climb and they just like kind of float up no what a fucking visual yeah. mo like splendid moment I swear I, cool. okay I gotta see it again but I swear they had like a really crazy impressive shot there where they they show them climbing up but then they the terrain like curves and they they hug that curve yeah. but it defies gravity and they're like how do they do that with wires the whole time i thought i could just see the wires but no there's no way like yeah. I, it was fucking masterful oh yeah yeah that would be really hard to do with wires because they're an angle i mean they yes. have to have yeah so they were going straight up and then they curve over to an angle we're like wait shouldn't his toes be dragging on well, the they, sand now they but start no when they do like the running jump off the dune they oh, they are out. at an angle going towards the rock i'm like oh well that's, i mean it was nice because i think that was a practical effect at yeah, least probably, partially there's definitely yeah. some cg yeah, yeah. In that, so in that awesome that sequence, the fact that you have to pick it apart is like it just well, speaks it, to how good it is, yeah. well done it was. I I think it's funny though because like the Harkonnen, I I Harkonnen. Yeah, you did this last same time. thing. <laughs> um, and what I said last time was that them like like the aesthetic for them being so obviously evil. I I still don't love that. Two on the nose. Like obviously, like if you are all in on the idea that like okay, this is the direction we're going with for their aesthetics, then. It is gorgeous. Like it's excellently executed. It's, it's amazing. But I think that I like the idea of uh, these houses in the Dune universe being more like, like you know, they're just different houses. They're not mm, necessarily like good and evil. That's the evil house, and that's the good house. You know. And I think we talked a little bit last time about how the Atreides clan isn't like the good clan. Like they are also just like pursuing their own power. Um, and uh, the Harkonnens are doing that too. So I, yeah. I, it feels a bit weird. I know that like it's a Hollywood movie and so they needed to kind of like, to okay, some extent, they are definitely yeah. the bad guys. You need to visually recognize the different yeah. houses. But it, it kind of takes me out of it a little bit because I'm like, are they? What? But I, you also have to remember they have their own planet, like a planet. I worth have of questions. Worth of culture, right? Bla is a black sun a thing? I don't know, but that was so dope. Yeah, all the visuals on the, the Harkonnen planet are yeah. so cool. They have that pale light. It's like you're watching a 20-minute short film that was black and white yeah. in the middle of this movie. But it's like, it's it's not just black and white. It's like like milk light. Like, it's thick. It has a blue. Yeah, and everyone it. looks so, like, just this has this weird complexion because of it, but then they go on the other planet and they look more closer to human. 
I I was just enthralled by the visuals on that planet. That was beautiful. Even the like one of my hit picks, I'll give it away now, uh, is the like ink blot fireworks. Yes, because you're like, wow, even their fireworks are gross. Yeah. I hate literally everything about the Harkonnens. Yeah, it's like a weird implosion. It just yeah, it makes you feel kind of sick to look at. Ugh. Yeah. But I so I I'm know. curious. So in the book, I got the impression that based on a discussion that Paul has more of a fall and is clearly kind of like a dark messiah. Yeah. This Whereas is, in the movie, he's I. They kind of present him as like he's kind of a good guy. Oh really? And I, I didn't get the sense super clearly that like I got the sense that he's about to fall, but I was expecting it to happen in the movie that like mm. he's going full like this is for me now. I mean, I okay. So I wrote down in my notes. I was like. I don't know if this uh, occurred to me when I was reading the book uh, or not, but this is really kind of like a villain origin story. Mm -hmm. Like he's, he's not a, like he starts out. And I think that's why the story is so compelling. The book starts out and the movie starts out with you thinking like, okay, this is a hero's journey. Let's Mm -hmm. go. Like, you know, the, he's the chosen one, et cetera. He's got stuff to deal with. He's got struggles to go through. He refuses the call. Yeah. And at the end, and it's like, it's a success story, but the worst kind of success. And yeah, he, he's but, like, but that's the whole through line of it. That's his resistance to going on this path. He doesn't want to be yeah. this savior because he knows that the path is, is awful. Yeah. It, it's not the best reality that he gets to live. It's just the least bad one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're all yeah. awful. Yeah. And I, I feel like the movie. So you think that the movie, like it, it, se- it still seems like he's a good guy at the end. I didn't, like I know from the discussion that he's supposed to be, you know, sort of dark yeah. uh, at the end, and I didn't feel that fully, you know. But, well, take there's, two parts, there's parts of it though, right? Like when he goes to that big siege where there all the leaders are there, mm-hmm. and then Jessica's like, "Oh no, he's go- he's going on too forcefully," and he's yeah. like doing these miracles and telling people what they're dreaming and crap. Yeah, that was, was awesome. That, that was compelling, man. That was oh, sick. I was, and you know. The real ones know I was obviously enhanced when I watched this movie. And I, <laughs> I, I don't know whether I'm embarrassed to say I was like, I was like tearing up during that. I was honestly in the crowd with the Fremen. I was ready to die for Muad'Dib, man. I was like, holy cow. <laughs> Listen, all guys. I'm witnessing. It was, I felt like uh, Christians when they watched Pastor the Christ. <laughs> I was like, this is what they must have felt like. I'm like, behold. It was so dope. Or like a And maybe you think I'm weird for feeling that way, but it was a great uh, experience to experience. Well, I think that's, to me, the greater strength of this over the previous one is that emotional engagement I felt. Like, there's so many scenes. And I think why why it works is that so many of this interplanetary politics is boiled down to these interpersonal conflicts. And I that's so much easier to engage with on a, a viewer level. Than the rules of lineage. Yeah, and marriage. exactly. Like when yeah. As, I found the my least favorite part of the movie is the middle when it started to devolve, quote unquote, into interplanetary politics where it's like, oh, this is going to happen. These people are going to come talk about this. And, and, so and you which, didn't like the scenes with Princess Irulan and stuff like that? I feel like Fr- uh, Francis the Pugh's state character. that the movie leaves us in, it, wa- it wasn't worth it. The amount of time that goes into that where there's other things in the movie I wish I could have seen a little bit more of, but those are still absolutely phenomenal scenes. Yeah. But I feel like now I felt like at the end of the movie, I was surprised that's where it was left Um, where it's like, Oh, now we're going to war. And I was like, wait, I thought that we're at the end, but I don't know. Yeah. I don't remember uh, whether the end of the, I meant to like read the second half. I told you I was going to read the second half of the book uh, this week. And I was like, like, that's crazy. That's not how does it matter? I didn't didn't even start. (laughs) No kidding. I couldn't. No Um, way. Uh, but so I forget exactly how the book ends, but I think it's mostly uh, like that's the vibe. Like he mm. he takes over, and it's like oh, this, the war is going to start now. And I don't think there's a whole lot of falling action. But there is a bit of a pause. It's not like they walked out of the palace and start, have to start shooting blasters at the sky. Yeah, yeah. because pew, pew, pew. they had or laser guns. They had a uh, guns. They had the threat of our nukes are going to destroy the spice. Obviously, the Lansgrad's not going to let that pass. So there's a bit of a ceasefire there. Yeah. They got a gun to the head of the greatest resource in the universe. Right. Which don't they, they all also have nukes. I guess. Yeah. They just, is it, I can't remember. Is Iraq like the only source of spice? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I see. I forgot that it was the only source of spice. Yeah. There was a few things where I was like, I think they told me the rules of this universe, but I can't yeah, quite remember. They have uh, in universe. They've tried to 
uh, make spice on other planets, but they all it all fails. Yeah. Is uh, is it ever revealed like w- where what the source of spice is? Yeah, it's the worms. It's the worms. It's the worms. Oh, of course it is. Is it because they grind up people and it's like life force? Isn't or something? it actually a microbe that the that is like inside the worms or that they leave or something like that? Oh, jeez. Remember know. those little bubbly things? They had like a term for it in the book. What was that? Sand trout? No. Those are just baby sandworms. I don't remember. Uh, there's probably, you know, I think we can go ahead and guess that there's some bacteria involved. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, it makes sense too. I didn't even think about that. The water of life is basically the, yeah. like the unfermented essence of spice. Yeah. Uh, it, gives it, yeah. it gives the visions. It's blue. Like it does the same blue eye thing. And it's like, it would be right. s- similarly related if it yeah. comes from the worms. It's basically like hyper, hyper, hyper concentrated yeah. spice. Yeah. yeah. It's like these guys are just, they're eating, like they have magic mushrooms that they like just put in their food. <laughs> and then like you, and then these guys over here are drinking, they're like eating their body weight in magic mushrooms. Yeah, like, yeah. And then giving it to f- f- babies and like your baby's baby. Yeah. I liked how they were like too spicy for the foreigner, eh? Yeah. It's like spicy. Yeah. Okay. But uh. spicy was not. The, so that's, that's pretty good. The movie had a couple, of, I laughed a few times. It was f- it was funny. I was like, as in the fir- uh, as in the first one, I kind of appreciated when there's a bit of comic relief. But at the same time, I'm like, I don't think it's supposed to. There was a couple right. times where I, I don't know if they wanted me to laugh, but I was laughing. Like oh, really? When, yeah. Like when his freaking um like Cuisard Hotterock th- like musical motif come motif <laughs> comes on. Yeah. And he does that like cross-eyed look when he's like, oh, the same look from the scene where he puts his hand in the box in the first one. Does he do know. the cross-eyed He did it in this one too. It was when like, I don't know, Jessica was telling him something and he was like staring at her like, oh, this revelation's crazy. <laughs> My favorite laugh of yours during the movie was the first time Christopher Walken did the Christopher Walken voice. Oh, I don't want to talk about that now. <laughs> we'll talk about that later, I think. Ba- Baron. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Wadib yeah. it's really impressive wow I want to stay with all this on spice. <laughs> I want to stay on the topic of visuals because I think like the cinematography in this it's a huge challenge to not have the full palette of colors to play with I think like to me Blade Runner 2049 is still the best looking movie of all time but that's because it has a full rainbow mm. uh, to push into your eyes. Yeah, and whereas like different scenes, there's like a very stark, very blue yeah, scenes, yeah, very yeah. orange scenes. But the 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 devils in the details in this, there's such incredible mastery of just like pushing colors a certain direction. Like early on, they push everything to red so that the green of their outfits blends better in the sand. But then later when he's kind of more naturalized as a Fremen, they give you more natural white light in the same setting. And you can see their green and it separates them from the desert a little bit more, even Mm. though it's they're wearing the same colors, but there's like a little bit of push. And then this thing exposure, every time they're like going above ground, below ground, there's just like so much detail. Like I said, there's just like no clipping. And so when the Harkonnen are, pure black it's just like everything pops and it's just like that's ultra avx baby yeah and everything just this movie is one of those movies where everything is in control there's nothing in there where it was like uh, let's just we, we got to yeah. make it work it's like everyone is putting their 100 percent into it like every fucking costume every light being yeah. set every every little bit of foley early on like i noticed there's a quiet the quiet scene when like the the harkonnen are landing and they're all like hiding in the sand Every time they move through the sand, like the texture, you could hear the texture of the sand that they were shuffling through. And it was so tense. I, I was drawn in so much by the sound design. Yeah. And I feel like that was one thing that I loved about part one uh, was kind of like the characterization of the sand in different ways. Like when the sandworm arrives and it goes like, oh, it's yeah. like, it's like, it's on like it's sand like becoming on a speaker. liquid. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, just how, how sand is characterized in different ways, depending on different contexts. And I think they kind of expanded on that here where we get to see them do more stuff. And like, you know, they, they do the thing where they pound on the oh, yeah. on the dune to kind of like, and it sounds different depending on where you're pounding on it. And then that, that's how they know how to put the thumper down. It's just like little tiny things like that. To your point though about the color, um, I feel like it lends, having that sort of like stark difference between, you know, one faction and another lends the whole thing this sort of like otherworldly feel like it 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 you know that it's a sci-fi slash fantasy thing or whatever but i think that so many movies just fail to give it sort of that like larger than life feel like you can see the seams and the costumes and stuff Mm -hmm. and everything here just like looked so good and it made me feel like i was in a uh 
prescient vision. You know? Even in the random, so even in the random costumes, like I was noticing the in the gladiator arena, those people in the black suits. They, oh, yeah. they have this weird <laughs> armor to kind of cover where the seams would be, so it just looks so perfect and like real. Yeah, not like a costume. Yeah, it's, right. uh, just, but it, it just does feel lived in because like there was a spot where we're we're seeing the back of one of those characters, and the character's like strafing, so his legs are super wide, so it's stretching the fabric, and the way that the lights going through you could actually see that the the fabric kind of in the groin like under their butt wasn't wasn't like tight to their skin mm. there was a gap between their skin because they're stretching like stretching out that way and the light could pass through it and that was just a, an imperfect like amount of realism mm -hmm. whereas mm -hmm. like it, yeah that's i don't know what i'm saying it's real no. clothes like i don't just it was, <laughs> yeah, super, yeah. It was yeah. super immersive well just we can talk about all the costumes because like all the bene Gesserit outfits are so cool like i mm. i think it's interesting all the royal outfits are sick yeah. too like everything that um florence Pugh got to wear those like little knives circling her face yeah. and shit <laughs> is are the, in the book are the bene Gesserit's kind of like this you know, uh, they have fashion shows. Is it <laughs> Dude, well, are they sort of like a metaphor day. for like, fe like sixties feminism where it's like this kind of like faceless force of women controlling everything behind the scenes. Like, is that, is there a metaphor about that? Cause like, well, they definitely, the idea is that, um, the, the politics of the universe are largely patriarchal, but mm. Everything is actually kind of being like the strings are being pulled Pull. by the Bene Gesserit, which because, is matriarchal. Yeah, so it's like the Dune Universal Society is not matriarchal, but it's they they actually de facto hold the power. is yeah, to, to yeah. steal a quote from my big fat Greek wedding. The the men are the head, but the women are the neck, and they can turn the head any way they want. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That's in your arsenal. I love that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a movie. Exactly. I, I could not tell you a single thing that happens in that movie, but that line really stuck with me. I remember the grandpa has like Windex, and he's always trying. Oh, he thinks yeah! it's like a cure for everything. Yeah. She like coughs, and he sprays Windex on her yep. or something in a restaurant. <laughs> That's all I remember. <laughs> I was like six. When I, oh, What's I your my big fat Greek wedding memory, what Riley? Got? I I don't have it. This, this is it. I've seen it though. <laughs> I just don't remember anything from it. I wasn't important enough for my brain, I guess. Um, okay, we've talked about how beautiful this movie is and mm. how everything looks so amazing. Let's talk about some of the characters though, and uh, how we felt about them. So, like, you know, Paul. How do, how do you guys like his characterization in this one? I feel like there were some parts where I'm like. I don't know, Timothy Chalamet, you know, I think, oh, really? that, I think that the vast majority of the time I love him. I love him as, as Paul. And I still think he was like probably the perfect choice, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in casting, but there are some moments where he's like yelling where I'm like, I can see Timothy Chalamet, the, mm -hmm. the, the kid who started off uh, like making a YouTube channel about Xbox controllers. He did. I yes. didn't know that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's just because I know that fact. But it's like, one, it's yeah. one of the challenges of a big movie like this, where it has to be star studded. Mm -hmm. But then you're bringing in the the weight of Christopher Walken and Dave Bautista. The baggage. The baggage. That's right. I feel like with Timothy, this is like the most range you've. He's got tons of range. Actually, yeah. like I've seen him play in a beautiful boy. I've seen him play a drug addict, like oh, yeah. young yeah, man who was just like crying and like having breakdowns. But this, in terms of like power fantasy, like mm -hmm. you, you, this is the movie where you see that end of the range. And so I think I agree that when he gets way up there, I can start to be like, whoa, <laughs> you can yell. Um, I don't know. Like he sounded but way for, But he sells it for me, man. I thought he oh, killed yeah. it. I thought yeah. he killed it. I, he sounded way better yelling in the Fremen, Fremen language. Yes. Than in English. Hmm. That takes the edge off a little yeah. bit. Yeah. When he started yelling in English, it was just like, and I'm a bro. Don't forget the most <laughs> no. important bro. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things I like with him is that he tells you right away that like he's doing this for vengeance. Uh, mm -hmm. But then he kind of backs away from that. And all of a sudden I was like, I was unsure if he was doing it for vengeance or if he was really buying into it or not. Like they kind of leave that unspoken long enough that it almost reset for me. Well, I think it's kind of part of his arc where he wants to do it his own way. It's a, it's a through line from the first one where he's like, I'm not part of your plans. Yeah. yeah. You know, and he didn't want to be part of the plan. Yeah. He's going to, and like his, like his dad told him he would in the first movie, you know, I found my way to it. He finds his way to it. He right. says that in this one. But the thing that it's interesting is it's all connected where like his mom's like, it's going to be this way. And he's like, fuck that. I'm not doing that way. Yeah. I'm going to do it my way. Mm. But my way just ends in the same spot. Yeah, you can't <laughs> control me, mom. She's like, yeah, you did exactly what I was. It's yeah. like, it's like the prophecy is just broad, 
broad strokes on a painting and he's able to just use a finer brush but he's all he's doing is adding detail to something that was already painted yeah. i what i loved about paul's characterization in this one was in contrast to the first one where his development he, he goes through development but it's kind of passive it's like based on these things that happened to him and that is kind of the story of paul atreides in a nutshell, he just kind of like, you know, he he gains the ability to see the future, but the whole thing is that he can't actually do anything. Like, he can kind of choose which of these multiple paths that he's going to try and go down. But, but it feels like his, day, his hands are tied. Yeah. Um, but in the first movie, it kind of felt a lot more passive. We see his abilities awakening, and he's like, oh, maybe, oh, well, maybe I could do something. And in this one, it's a lot more active. It's mm -hmm. a lot more like he has to struggle and decide which way to go. Um, but not though, because there's that scene where he's like, I'll be the last one. You all head to the South. I'm the yeah. last, just me. And then he just has a vision and sees that he's like, shit. Yeah, I have to go. I, I have to go to the South and yeah. I have to drink the juice and it's the only path. But I think I still, that still felt active to me because he initially is like, no, 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 I'm not doing it. And only once he realizes that, like, okay, actually, it's just it, the best decision is to. No do one that. convinced him. He saw it himself. Yeah, exactly. Do so you, it did. It did. It felt more active. That was probably one of the things I didn't love is that that's such an important thing is a vision, uh, instead mm -hmm. of like you know a naturally occurring thing that's like characterization or like uh, character conflict that pushed it that way. Uh, did that bother you guys, or does it? Well, make you do more have to remember book? like the lore that we, we spoke about a lot in the first episode, which is that it's. It's not like paranormal. Mm. Um, well, it, it, it kind of feels like it is when you're seeing the past and like all the memories of every Reverend Mother ever are getting they, like transferred yeah. telepath like telepathically. That sounds weird. But as far as the I always thought of the prescience is that you're just so smart that, you know, that you can see how these things fit together and see, and calculate mm -hmm. that there's only one path. I used the example before of like, you see a ball bouncing into the street and a kid following it and a car coming and you can kind of see shit, the, the velocity of that kid going for that ball, he's gonna get hit by that car. Mm -hmm. The driver's not looking, you can you see how it plays yeah, out yeah. and he can just do that to the nth degree. So when he looks f in the future like that, I don't th see it as like, it's not like Mufasa coming in the clouds and being like Simba. So what's gonna happen? Or like mm. a like Obi Wan or something. It's more just yeah. He's, he's just so playing out the. He's so right. enlightened. That's fair. I I to be honest, I had forgotten that that's how it worked in this universe. Uh, it feels very supernatural in the movie. Well, like I said, like it kind of gets there with like this fetus talking to you and stuff. Yeah. Like where? How is that working? Although the visuals of the fetus being injected with the fucking—did you think you were gonna see a psychedelic <laughs> getting injected to an embryo in this movie? Uh, oh. That shit was cool. I was sold. That was the moment I was sold because I knew from the books that it gets even wackier. Like I knew from the books that there was gonna be a freaking like talking fetus, and I was like, "How is that gonna not be cringe?" And I just I learned. I, today I learned that it, I think that is the strength. Denise Villeneuve's strength. Because my wife hates Lord of the Rings, hates Star Wars. She's she like, hates this, Lord of the she, Rings. Yeah, she's like, huh. are you children? This is so cringe, and this is for kids. <laughs> it's so stupid. Yeah. And yet, if you think of the lore of Lord of the Rings, the mythos, the lessons, that has such parody with Dune. They're on the same yeah. level, like mythically, and yeah. like, yeah. You, you know, the themes thematically, they're on the same level. Yeah. Um, but somehow. Like if I'm having a conversation and my wife is, has never seen Dune and I'm like, yeah, was that cool when you wrote on the big worm? She'd be like, what the <laughs> fuck are you talking? And I, she watched, she walked in the room when I was watching Dune 1984, like before oh, yeah. oh, the yeah. news Dune came out, she saw like Lynch's Dune. You're just like, what the fuck yeah. is this bullshit? <laughs> but somehow Denis can make any hard sci-fi concept, any kind of weird cringe, like superpower thing, just so intense yeah. and cool. I was, he takes, takes the cringe well, off I, of things. I think one of his strengths is that he, he, takes the cringe ne off. he never relies on dialogue to explain things. He just shows it like visually. He's very good at just like giving you little like shots and sequence that explain things yeah. without having to be like someone telling you how a suit works or you know how the gravity like the scene when uh, what's his trainer's name? Josh Brolin? Gur Gurney. Gur when Gurney lands you know he taps his leg on the way down and taps it again yeah, to slow yeah. to, to go back to normal gravity. It's like I get it. That's all I need. I don't yeah. need someone to explain to me anything more about that suit. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, interestingly, when you, st when you said that, I was like, mm, cause like one of my, one of my, one of the things that bothered me was the fact that 
some of the visions feel a bit cheesy. Mm. So like I would to to what you were saying, I was specifically looking forward. He's pointing forward, at me by the way for audio yeah, listeners. To James, yeah. What I was specifically looking forward to seeing how Denis would do that scene where uh Jessica takes the water of life and because that whole scene I remember it being so internal. Like there was like a n like a number of pages just describing like the effects that the water of life is having on her body and like mm. the psychic awakening that's happening. And then she like becomes aware of, of Ali, Aaliyah in her womb. And then they kind of like talk and Aaliyah is awakening. And like, because if this isn't super clear, I think in the, in the movie, but Aaliyah um, is a reverend mother and the re being a reverend mother means that you have access to all the historical rev reverend mothers. So is the mom not a reverend mother? It is Jessica just the is. daughter? Jessica, Jessica oh, yeah. becomes Both. a reverend she mother. She became one yep. for the, the Fremen. And so when they do the ceremony, she gets the memories of every lived mm -hmm. reverend mother. And they did show that in the movie. You could hear them like all of us and you hear all the voices. Yeah, yeah. And so you take that on. And it's not said explicitly like you said. No, it is because Jessica says... I have all that suffering. Yeah, I'm I knew a, that I'm Jessica got it, but I didn't know that the fetus, I knew that the fetus yeah. obviously had a psychic awakening. That's the weird part about her being pregnant and that's just like not normal. Right. Is that now a child's getting all and that. they're like, what have we done? That was a pretty cool moment. Because, yeah, that's when, when, uh, when Gai Gaius Monam, <clears throat> the like, the big, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the big cheese, Reverend Mother says, abomination. Um, that's the term for like what Aaliyah is. Mm. And I guess she's calling like Jessica an abomination too, because like she's, no, she said that she said abomination to, to Timothy Chalamet, to, to Paul. Yeah. That was kind of strange. I guess because she's saying that like, you're not the right Kwisatz Haderach that we no. were trying to make. They were trying, Jessica was supposed to have a girl who would yeah. then mate with Fade Raltha to create the, the Kwisatz Haderach. Right. That was the plan. They screwed it up. They, but this is what's so amazing. And I, I, I'm like kind of disappointed that we didn't because in the book Aaliyah's born. So oh. the this in in part in Dune Part Two the movie everything kind of takes place over like the course of a year, um, and in the book it's over the course of three years. In the book there's actually a time jump. I remember you saying three yeah. years later, and I thought that's where they were going to separate the movies. Yeah, but instead they and then I thought okay it must be happening Dune Two is it going to be twenty minutes in right at the beginning I don't know and then they just decided. We don't need it. Yeah, and I think yeah. that was a good choice because it just feels like such a natural flow. And forward. I had no idea how they were going to make, how was he going to knock the cringe off of a three-year-old that talks like a 40-year-old? Yeah. <laughs> so like I'm, <laughs> part of me was kind of sad that we didn't get Aaliyah born and like freaking everybody out because she's a pre-born uh, uh, consciousness. And so she's like, yeah, she's talking like an adult. <clears throat> um but it's for the best. That would have been weird. Yeah, 100%. There's no way to make that work. When I saw like the photorealistic looking embryo, yeah. I was like, that's perfect. Yeah. yeah. That's all we need. This is a much better way to do it, I think. Even the lighting in those scenes. I'm sure I, it's probably all CG. I don't think they like made a little embryo thing that they could light, but it looked... Maybe. May, they, they might may have made maybe. a little... Like if, you've ever, if you've ever did like body worlds and stuff, they have like so those casts like yeah. an acryl acrylic of all like the stages of gesta gestation. Maybe they made one like totally synthetically maybe they used a real one i have no idea but it, it could so have real. been practical there's there's almost no effects in this movie that i feel like felt like cg the only time did they show the mouse in this movie they did show the mouse that was yeah. weird yeah. that was a very star wars special edition yeah full the full, <laughs> it looked like on the first one too like full animal is, <clears throat> it looks weird yeah the uh, the other cg that i thought looked bad was uh when austin butler's walking in the arena and it's just his head walking through the crowd in the background that felt very C like that felt very green screen with cg in the background mm. to me mm. that whole sequence kind of the crowd didn't quite move right or something <laughs> i didn't notice but um how do you guys feel about jessica um being positioned as kind of like almost villainy here like in the book she actually like it's paul who is being like, I have to do this. I have to mm. be the 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 messiah or whatever. And Jessica's kind of like, I don't know. Let's 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 chill out a little bit. Is like, that true? We have to be careful. I distinctly remember her going forth and doing the missionara productiva stuff. Yeah. No, the, I think I think that she was like, I think that there were times when he was like, no, I'm gonna like we're we're doing this hard. He was just more into it than she was mm. in the book, um, at times. And in this one, she was like, 
I just loved her after her she had her awakening or whatever. She's like walking around the siege, like talking to oh, yeah, Aaliyah yeah. and being like, "We must convince them. The we weak start with ones. the weakest." <laughs> yeah, I was like, "Ooh, I, I don't know." I, like it was a it was a it was a new characterization mm. for her, and I I liked it. I totally forgot. I have I read the book like five years ago at this point. Mm. Yeah. I really it, it, so it worked for me. It totally. Worked yeah, for I me. really enjoy her character. <clears throat> She's very villain villainous, mm-hmm. uh, and I think it's better to have Paul play like play both sides a little bit more because uh, we're, we're more attached to Paul so I think emotionally well, Paul's also between her trying to push that you know propaganda mm-hmm. and and Chani who's like Fremen to the bone and is and is thinking like this needs to come grassroots mm-hmm. from the Fremen mm-hmm. bottom up and so he's so he's straddling those two worlds throughout the movie yeah I liked, I really liked the um, Chani's characterization oh. as, it felt weird at Can first. Can we pause though? Just, yeah. I'm so sorry I always do this, but I really would like to talk about Chani, but just one Rebecca Ferguson thing. Go. She can do so much with her face she's alone. Oh my gosh. With just her face she's alone. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. There's that long close up when she's like doing that, that monologue that I was just talking about and the, the camera stays on her face for so long and she's just... She's just like slightly altering mm-hmm. the angle of her head, but like, I don't know, it works so I, I well. heard an anecdote once of like Al Pacino going through some script. Or, I forget what movie it was. I don't know if it was Heat or whatever, but he was going through these four spaces. He had this huge monologue. It was four pages long. And he said, it might have been Godfather. He said, wait, is he in? Yeah, he's Godfather. Yeah. Uh, he, 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 he said, throw this out. I can do all this with a look. Mm. And uh, you're kind of like, ah, okay, Al Pacino, he's got a lot of bravado, but like... <coughs> Ferguson makes me think that is, that's a true story because she could do that. I believe it. Anyway. She's great. Chani. I will say I just saw a, a Silo on Apple TV Plus and it's Rebecca good. Ferguson is great in it, but she's doing an American accent mm. and she's Irish, I think. Um, and it really comes out. Well, the, doing the British accent here is way better. One of the first podcasts we ever did was on Dr. Sleep. It was like episode oh, two, yeah. one or two, and she was in it, and she was cringe as hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah super cringe. She had that stupid hat. hat. Get rid of that hat. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. God. Brutal. Too many, like, little feathers in that you movie. You know, the wrong hat can really ruin a performance. <laughs> <laughs> but Zendaya, I have a, a close friend of mine, was like, Ugh, she's going to ruin the movie. I don't think she's a strong actor. Fuck that. Oh, no. no, she was great. She rules. Um, and there was a big, it, it was a big difference, because in the book, she basically supports him all the way. Even at the end when um, uh, he says, like, oh, Irulan, you and I are going to rule the galaxy universe. And and Chani is like, yep, that's what you got to do. You got to let this one slide. Yeah, but in this one, she basically, like, she spends half this movie kind of, like, warming up to him and them, and them falling in love. And then the second half, she's just, like, pissed at him the whole time. Well, because she, the whole thing is, with the Fremen in, in general and her in particular is, like, can we trust this outlander? Mm. Can we trust this guy? And she decides soon she falls in love with him and she's all in with the trust. And then this appears to be a betrayal. So there's another big, like an extra order of magnitude. Can I buy in with this level of trust where the guy literally has another wife? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But is it really for us and for the Fremen? Even though he's doing it a way that I don't want, I want to do this grassroots. It should be from the people, but it's not. That's kind of one of the funny things about about I mean not funny but like it's one of the things that characterizes Dune is it's it's sort of this Game of Thrones world where you know true love isn't really a thing like uh, Paul and Chani love each other but they don't love each other uh, well sorry okay wait they love each other but that's not going to get in the way of them doing what must be done which is Paul marrying Irulan so like Chani remains his concubine, but like she's his wife, you know? And so I don't know. It's like that. You know, it's bullshit. Baby. In the Dune universe, no one's like, oh, I actually, I don't want to spoil stuff, but like, I guess there's uh, some, some characters who do things for the sake of love, but. And she was such a bad bitch in this movie though. Mm. I think the part that was sickest was when everyone is meant to kneel, except for like the powerful people in the room, like. The Reverend Mother Jessica, she doesn't kneel. Paul's yeah. standing there. Earl Lan's standing there because she's the queen. Yeah. And Chani yeah. remains standing. That was a great mm. shot. She remains standing. Yeah, which everyone is, r- goes down, yeah. She's telling the room that she's the queen. She's telling Paul, I'm still at your side. But then she walks away. Yeah. Telling Paul, uh, you got some splain to do. Yeah. But... I- even, it, even though she's like crushed like mm-hmm. when when he says that he's gonna marry Erlon, she's like so crushed and you can see it yeah. going over her face and everything she never 
sheds her water for him. She mm-hmm. never, a, a single tear doesn't come out. She's like, okay, fuck you. When, at bottom, I'm Fremen. She cries elsewhere in the movie, or is that just Paul that cries at she's, that moment? She sa- sheds a tear to to break the water of life. Um, oh, that's right. Coma. Yeah. Which is interesting. It's like nail polish. <laughs> you you have nail polish on your nail that you need to get off. You use more nail polish. Mm. You're in a you're in a water of life coma. Uh. You got to dip your finger in the water of life to get them out. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's the tear that did it though. Nah. Yeah. It was, what? <laughs> what's this? It like, was magic. What's the symbolism <laughs> of mixing the tear with the water of life? I have no idea. <clears throat> the symbolism. It was like it. the prophecy, like the desert spring will do something. But why not just her tear? What? Well, why she not? is the because her name means desert spring. I get that. But why not just her tear? Because everyone drinks spicy water there. You okay. know, okay. Bub- it would be it bubbly would be too, only. It would be too vanilla just with a tear. Mm, they need to, yeah, that rocky need, road. Yeah, it'd be too. It'd be too uh, too much of a white person thing. I always thought the the spice tasted like cinnamon. <laughs> is that in the book? Do they say that? I think they say that it has kind of a cinnamony uh, vibe. How good do those blue eyes look? They don't look cheesy at all. Look great. I I heard some people saying that they looked kind of weird in the first one, but I I don't feel I, I felt. And I there's they different great. degrees of it, right? There's kind of like exposure blue, where it's just a little bit of of blue, and then there's like I just drank the water of life, and now I'm full on blue. Yeah, it, well, it's just like Liat Kynes in the first one. Like you can be an off world and have the white eyes, and then you you just live there for a mm. long time, they yeah, become blue. blue. Mm. And if you do a lot of spice, I think the priests and shit usually have bluer eyes. Mm. Man, if someone on frickin' Etsy can make some, or if Alibaba can make some sweet blue eye drops that just give you like the best Halloween costume this year, that that would sell. I mean, I think you would just do contacts, no? Like but it's in the dangerous. whites too. Oh yeah, I guess. Put that Alibaba drops in my eye. You can get contacts that go, yeah, like big color ones that go past. Yeah, you can oh, do okay, big contacts, no. big ones. Um, Irulan. That's the princess, Florence Pugh. Way more interesting of a character than I expected for, uh, coming out of the book. Yeah. I loved the, her in this. In the book, she's kind of just like a... She's kind of dumb. Like, she's a Bene Gesserit. She's she, intelligent. Like, she writes the, the chronicles that you read in yeah. between chapters. But, yeah, is, but is, she think, not, is she being manipulated? I think it's like, in the book, her characterization is a bit more like she's not built for the sort of, mm. like, high-stakes intrigue world. Like, yep. she, she wants to chronicle things. She's intelligent. She can analyze stuff. But she's not, like hard like the other characters and in this one i feel like they they make her seem a lot smarter than she seems in the yeah book. she's like gathering intel she knows everything about everything at all times and knows what needs to be done yeah. which yeah. i i i was like why i don't know i liked it i think it just made her like more powerful and interesting was she i can't remember if in the book she kind of like we see her much before the end of the book i thought she just kind of like shows up at the end. Yeah, well, they they couldn't do that because in a book, you can just mention a character a bunch of times and then, but but in a movie, like you've, you, you just got to get used to a face. Yeah. So that it was so smart for them to ruin the first scene. Like, okay, get, get the characters exposed to this character. This actor is in this movie. We're going to see him again in like an hour and a half from now. And I think it, she also has good exposition. Like that's kind of her narrative devices. She's right. writing the audio logs or whatever. I I liked her fine. I think it's always challenging when it feels more like an investment in the future story than it is for this movie. Yeah. Like there it pays off fine and like she's always good in the scene, but her story bits don't really lead to anything super important. Well, they they, they do though because they that's how he's he has become the enter- emperor. He's she is the vehicle for him becoming emperor. And that's in this movie. Yeah, but the like yes, I I see what you're saying. I think why it doesn't feel like he's become emperor is because the rest of the houses that would certify they're his contesting it. they're contesting it. So it's like he is technically sort of emperor, but he's not really. We don't see him get it crowned. Yeah, and so like it's good. I I like where this movie left off, but it it it, like I said, it just feels like it's an investment for continuing the franchise rather than we. she had a specific arc for this movie. Mm-hmm. I loved how, getting more screen time with all the different uh, houses, races, planets, or whatever. Mm. Like in the first one, I've watched, I've only watched the movie in full like two or three times, but I've watched select scenes dozens of times. Huh. And one of the scenes I always go to is the chapter that's called The Herald of the Change. Mm. I stand before you, yeah, yeah. Herald of the Change. <laughs> you know the "It's done" guy with the tiny ears. Oh my god, his ears! Are, yeah, it's hilarious. Um, you will I, take ownership of Varakis. Exactly. 
Yeah. I always like the small little characters that are just in for a second, like the the people that are doing the computation or whatever to run the ships that look like brains or the the tanks that look like brains. Yeah, uh, and, and, and Vil- Wait, is so good. The Arrakis right? tanks that are like head shaped. Oh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Harkonnen, um, those are Harkonnen uh, spice harvesters. Spice harvesters. Okay. Yeah. The, but yeah, Vinilov or his casting agent is so good at picking weird looking people. Yep. Um, but I like how I love that scene and I love the ritual in that scene. You get to see their ceremony. And in this movie, you get to see like three more ceremonies. You get to see Harkonnen ceremonies when he's like putting the necklace on the next like governor of, of Arrakis. Um, you get to see some more a like funeral. a bunch of Jenny, Benny Jesuit together. I thought that was such a cool scene. Uh, you know, even just the little details that are thought out in the book, but like they just feel so. I fleshed out in this movie like they put the, the person in the bag as part of the ceremony like mummifying him but it just dehydrates him yeah, and then yeah, yeah. that's the introduction to this little lake of souls or whatever what is it called yeah I think it's something like that something but like that whatever yeah we we were speaking of, I was in the first episode about how like it, there was so much more depth to the Fremen culture in the book about mm. the names they have and like how hallowed water is and I was like oh, I kind of missed that but no, it just had to wait. It's yeah. in this movie. So yeah. the first like hour of this movie was all that. And I thought that they did such a sweet job of harvesting the blood from them. Yeah. The dude's still alive and Chami's just like oh, gets so swatched his hand away. She's such a bad bitch. <laughs> yeah, that was so cool they, seeing those. They were filling their armor with with <clears throat> grenades, but then they put it in the worms. I, I kind of didn't understand that part because I assumed that they were like yeah. making bodies like they were putting explosives in the armor so that they could have the Harkonnens pick them up and then they could blow up stuff from the inside. Oh, I didn't see them putting... Did I see... Were they taking like, grenades out? <laughs> was no, this maybe. like the very first thing? Because I... So they kill all the Harkonnen. Maybe you missed they it. They definitely had the worm to come and remove any sign of Harkonnen. Yeah. That was yeah. their goal. But you're right. They did. They packed something in there. Were they water canteens? Was it grenades? It seemed like... Yeah, it seemed like they were putting... Some, anyways, why, I must have just Why would they put grenades in there? Well, like I, I thought they, they That's were what gonna, he's asking. Yeah, I thought they were going to pick up the bodies and then blow it up from inside their ships or something. But oh, but no, they did not. No, they just gave it to the worm. Gonna need to rewatch that. Fuck one. you, worm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> More like bye, halud. <laughs> yeah, they, the the worms are so well animated, and the scale of them is mm. so impressive. It's just like. They're monumental. Now, when they're ri- like riding in on like three or five of them into the palace at the end, there, I was like, that oh, scene, fuck. that scene, like, yeah, just c- totally delivered on my vision from the from the book. Well, and it's so hard because you know, when you're making a movie, you have to like give every, you have to give big things at the beginning of the movie, and then it's hard to escalate. Whereas this movie has such good restraint on all the battles and the conflicts; they're all pretty small scale, and they even say it like, "There's only 200 of us." doing all these fights and it's like these little guerrilla strikes yeah, at bases yeah. and stuff and we don't ever get a big battle until the end yeah holy fuck that it was, was awesome. epic yeah seeing like uh, Chani just like slice through the army yeah and I love the fighting style like we see more of it here than we did in the first one the Fremen sprint up to you and then just jump into a flying triangle and yeah. take you down uh, yeah, I was, yeah did you recognize some of the moves because I'm I don't even know what's happening it's just like suddenly they're upside down and flipping people over using their legs I'm like what is going on but it looks cool yeah it definitely looks cool there, there are a lot of ankle slices yeah so the question I had and it probably makes more sense in the book when they launched the nukes but Beside the army, is that because if they hit the ship, it would have done nothing because of the shields? They launched the nukes at the shield wall, which is the big rock formation that keeps the sandworms out. Uh, ah, yeah. did they so explain they, that in the movie, or is that a book knowledge thing that you? Uh, they do. He he's looking at the map and he's pointing. He's like, "We're gonna break the shield, uh, shield wall." In okay. the first movie, they explain what the shield wall is okay. while they're flying in on a ornithopter yeah. or something. I like them for a ship. I thought it was fucking cool. Yeah, and like, that the way was it's great. Like, almost like a sun, like it's on fire. Is yeah, that, what was that? Is that because it's so hot because of that planet, or is that entry? just by design? I think that's the shields being disrupted by uh, the storm. Oh, oh yeah, it looked like some kind of technology for sure. So Not, cool. It was definitely technology. That yeah. I had, and then that that fucking ball of a ship just lands and like unfurls a city under yeah, it. That was yeah, so cool. yeah, that was that crazy. Was awesome. I didn't understand why the tanks weren't firing at the worms. What tanks? So when the worms are charging or whatever, there's all these big mechanical structures that they. I, th- I assume they were tanks or ships or something. They're ships. So yeah, why weren't they firing at the worms? They were, on, they were landed. They were. They were like the, drop ships. The ornithopters came in and like unloaded on the worms, but I think the idea is that you can. Th- doesn't There's do not anything. enough time. The, wor- the sandworms are virtually indestructible. Okay. Um, that just, I, in my brain, they look like big 
artillery or something and they just kind of stood there while they yeah. got consumed no those are the, like those are all those big things I, I'm pretty sure that's what you're talking about maybe there were tanks there but I didn't I don't remember seeing like, it doesn't tanks yeah. with like barrels and stuff but like yeah I think all those big uh, vessels were like spaceships oh yeah like landers and like that's what they transport or something that's what they take off in the end they're 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 taking off to like start the jihad. Even I like the design of the emperor army. Like it's almost like a <gasps> n- like a NASA punk <laughs> army. Where the starter like, car, the, the white. Car? Yeah, and like the they have like it looks almost like like a a human astronaut suit. Yeah, with like slight modifications. Like obviously it's a little bit more alien, but like it that. It that almost looks like it came from the set of Interstellar, but just yeah. more streamlined. Yeah, I think that's baggy. really this. This I mean, again, it's what gives Dune. Uh, these movies such an interesting aesthetic is that you you wouldn't ex- like they they're wearing kind of like fabric jumpsuits mm-hmm. like you know it's I, it it looks like there's harder parts and it's like armor but it's more like it's like woven they, so yeah, that it's if, like if woven, you yeah, it's like, like it could withstand a, a a knife yeah yeah yeah, yeah. or a, a scrape anyway I will say that like we're talking about the the fighting and like it's all like knife fighting and uh and so it was really cool to see in the emperor throne room they the Sardaukar have like actual long swords there That's and cool. I was like that looks sick I want somebody with like with a long sword swords <laughs> are so much cooler <laughs> That's yeah. what I crave in cinema <laughs> Well it's like I obviously the 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 fights in Dune are very like Dune Esque, you know, like it have Dune has its own thing, you know, like Star Wars. There's lightsaber fights, and it's like you got these big swords. And it's you're a fighting. dance, yeah. And in this one, it's a dance as well, but you're using like smaller blades. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, part of me just, you know, I'm I'm so, I'm looking for Dune to fill that Star Wars shaped hole in my heart. I, uh, it's it's filling it good, man. I think I was so. realizing how much like it never will. How much I'm bringing, different. yeah. I'm bringing so much Star Wars into Dune. You know, like in ways that you don't even appreciate because that has been like the major cultural force for for people our age and even older um, for just decades. It's shaped so many so much of what we think of as sci fi that in ways that I'm just like having to reevaluate with Dune, like a big example was it annoyed me initially. And this is almost like kind of spicy, but it annoyed (laughs) me initially that the Fremen were like all sorts of races they were like, they basically were, they, I'm like, why do they all have different accents? And like, yeah. it's like they just casted anyone but white people could be Fremen. It's like, they don't all have the same look. They're like mm. all kinds of brown people. But, and I was like, how does that make sense? Right. Like, cause, and I, I realized it's just because I'm coming in with Star Wars baggage where I'm yeah. like, each planet has one look. <laughs> you go to the water planet and they all look like this. And I was like, Arrakis is like earth sized and on earth. We have all the different yeah. kinds of yeah. people but because think, they're in this that movie. But all think, that diversity can exist on one planet, so it's not like world breaking mm-hmm. to have one like group of people have so much genetic diversity. No, yeah, it's it's not, but it, it, I, it was also kind of it's something you have to get over. Uh, it start it's it makes sense later, especially in this one where they talk a lot more than they do in the book about there being like different regions and mm. different like you know the, the people in the south are more fundamentalist which is not a word they say in the book at all really no like they talk about like you know some fremen being more fanatical than others or whatever but the, there's not like a regional difference mm. um there, there's not as much of a emphasis on like oh that fremen is from that other area it's kind of like fremen are more of a monolith. Imagine there's fre- there's from with like southern United States accents, like <laughs> Lisa and well, it, was, it was it's 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 still something that I have to get over when I'm watching the movie because you got Javier Bardem in there with a Spanish accent, and then you got that's what was world breaking me in the first one. I was like, what the hell yeah. are they doing? And like, then you got people with American accents, you got people with British accents, you got people with kind of like Middle Eastern accents, and like their their dialect is is their language is like kind of a Middle. But then when you based. see it this way, you're like. It just actually deepens the lore. Yeah, You're yeah. Like, yeah, they have so many languages. No, I think that really added to it. Yeah, like saying like uh, Chani like dismissing uh, Stilgar and because he's like fundamentalist or whatever because he's from the south. He was a source of comedic relief. Oh my gosh, let's yeah, like his whole bit about like oh watch out for the demons, don't listen to the gym, blah 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 blah. blah. <laughs> God, but it's true. <laughs> yeah, I think that was a good way to go about it. Like they they needed a character there who was going to be like seeing the signs and fainting and stuff. And if they played it straight, it would have not as been as good. Mm. Yeah, I I I feel like I could have done with one or two less still gar comedic moments. Um, because I I think that him being so 
uh, in him believing so hard in, in Paul, I think is like stronger when you don't kind of think of him as like an, an idiot, you know, like, like he's being hoodwinked, you know? You, Cause I think one of the strengths of, of Dune is the idea that like, it's faith, it's science, it's fate, it's all these things. And but there's no like verses, like it's everything all the time, mm. all at once. Well, see, I got the sense early on that it was he, you know, he believed, but he was kind of forcing himself to believe. And then as the movie progresses, he's buying into it more right. and Especially more. Especially if you consider this is one movie with part one. Mm. He's very cautious at yeah. the beginning. He gives yeah. them a shot. There's other people on his crew that are like, let's just kill them now. And he's like, gives them a shot because, you know, they're good fighters and stuff, at least they're respectable. But then it, so I think it's a pretty gradual escalation to, to the, the final like culmination <laughs> of it is when like, what, a, what like Paul does something and then, and then uh, Javier Bardem basically does like a NBA style celebration. <laughs> <laughs> let's go. I lost yeah. it in the theater. Yeah. It was so yeah. funny, man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, listen to all guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was a great scene. Uh, what scene was that? Paul. Is Paul, that right at oh, the end? I don't know what you're talking about. but When he, he gets stabbed, but he uses the being stabbed to trick. Oh, when, when yeah. He, that's right at the end. Yeah, yeah. When he goes like, Marty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this fucking guy. <laughs> um, the, the, the guy is stabbing, Austin Butler. What did you guys think of that? Okay, yeah. Let's talk about Fade Ratha. I feel like it started really bad. His accent right oh, really? on the Did first it scene. Yeah, it, it the first accent I was like, uh oh, this is gonna be bad. It was like southern grow, gravelly, yeah. but then it that landed was so confusing. more like and a I think barren it, impersonation. Yeah, I think he landed better there. So is that intentional? That he starts off being his own thing and then he goes like, I'm just gonna imitate the Baron's voice. I don't. Maybe? That must be. A or is mistake. that just the actor? Because he said like, I, I'm gonna cut you up good. <laughs> I think I think Austin Butler. That's his natural accent. Is like a southern one, mm. right? I don't know. I think it is. I he, think it, he was Elvis for too long. Yeah, he, he took I, on the Elvis affectations. I, I think I watched an interview He gets with stabbed him. more sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Falls over. <laughs> it's not okay. Um, I think, I, th- uh, my, I feel like the only thing that explains the fact that in the first scene, he kind of says like, uh, so he references it, my darlings. I'm like. Yeah, it was weird. I think it has to be a mistake. Like, like that was him just not doing the accent right because the whole rest of the movie i think but he, even he's doing a barren impression is he doing is the character of fader alpha doing a barren impression or is the actor what's his name doing uh, a Butler. Butler doing Butler a, doing a, a, a scars guard scars guard yeah. impression yeah, that, yeah. No, I, no i don't know well no i think like in universe uh fader alpha has the same accent as the baron so in what we saw was austin butler doing a martin Skarsgård accent uh, Stellan Skarsgård, yeah. That's Stellan? Yeah, I think so. No, that's Martin. Martin? I think that's Stellan. No. Okay, it might here, be. Here we go. Look it up. Yeah, <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Yeah, it's yep. Stellan. Yeah. Martin. Stellan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to know I was right. Okay, uh, speaking of Skarsgård, though, <laughs> Austin Butler looks like that other Skarsgård who played It. <laughs> oh, yeah. in this movie yeah he does kind of because the, yeah. they, they accentuate the brow with the lines up well he's got yeah and he's got no eyebrows yeah yeah but the the, the brow ridge is accentuated yeah. with the angles of it going up to the forehead yeah. and and the That's it a clown the it clown wears eye makeup that has the long lines that go up and down vertically right. so it kind of just like morphs their faces yeah. together yeah i feel like that was a character i wish there was more time in this movie to do more with fader I, alpha yeah i thought it was good and they like I think it was a very effective use of the limited time he had. But they could have game like 20 minutes still. Yeah. Cool uh, maybe. That whole gladiator I, sequence. I think I thought that was really cool. But again, I, I, I got a sense of what the character was supposed to be, but I feel like I didn't get enough opportunities to see him be to outsmart people. And maybe that's, maybe he doesn't, maybe he is just brutal. Like the, his strategy is just bomb everything. And by bombing everything, he, he wins. But I, I, I wanted to believe he was, you know, going to be Paul Trades match and well, I didn't get that sense. In the book, he mm. wins the duel or almost wins the duel, a false victory because he cheats. He has mm. one of his blades is dipped in a illegal poison and he just grazes Paul, but the poison gets in and that's what injures Paul to the point where he almost loses and they just scrap that in this yeah, movie, I'm right? I'm glad. I, I I liked that he was, you know, more honor driven than that version would be. Uh yeah, like the the gladiator fight at the beginning was like honor driven. Yeah, like he, he yeah he believes in you know the battle. You fought well, Atreides. Yeah, 
That's true. And like when Yua is not poisoned, he's like, no, let's go. Let's like, yeah, he's like, happy yeah, about it. Yeah. And he's like, what, don't was touch that him. Yue? No, you is yeah. dead. No, that was Yue. No. Yeah, it was. I was just another Asian Atreides guy, dude. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was Yue. Didn't Yue die in the first one? The Baron killed him. Did he? Yeah, because he came back. He's like, hey, I, I helped you betray the okay, Atreides. So, so now give me my, my Wana or whatever. My, free my wife. And he's like, yeah, your wife's dead. And so are you. <laughs> okay. So I, mm. I watched. You're racist. I only managed to watch uh, two thirds of Dune Part 1 before today. I meant to watch, I meant to finish it and like, I didn't finish it and I was like, oh, I'm going to be missing things. Um, so that wasn't you. Cause like when they came in and they said like, oh, it's your last chance Atreides. And then they do this close up of that Asian guy's face. And I was like, I don't know. I thought he looked, but he's not like, Atreides. Huh? He's a souk doctor. It's so, a, it's the same way as like, okay, but yeah i get that but i thought they were calling him atreides because to them yeah. he's basically a trade yeah i don't think so I think but, it, so like, that, that but, character's but dead. you're saying that wasn't you i don't think so okay because i was like dang uh i fun. wrote down that uh ua looks like an asian jk simmons <laughs> 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 he was he was he was bald with the with the facial hair mm. that guy looked like an asian jk simmons i'm not give give me this <laughs> <laughs> yo can you do a jk simmons impression no Really? No, I don't know. Have you, Spider Man? If you worked on it, I bet you could. If you worked on I've, it, yeah, but I haven't worked on it, so I'm not going to try right no, now. No, no, no. You don't want to do that. Um, uh, did you guys feel like this movie was long, or did it fly by? I had to pee so bad for so long um, that yes. Uh, um, and there was I. I thought someone said a spoiler to me. Maybe they were making this up, but someone in the lunchroom like today was like, "Oh, sp you want to know a spoiler? There's gonna be a part three. And so I was in this weird spot where there must have been over an hour left where I was like, am I looking at, is this the end of the movie right now? Mm. Uh, is there going to be more? Or are they going to leave that whole thing to a part three? And they just kept that close to the chest, the whole marketing cycle. Um, and it turned out, no, they wrapped up the whole story, but I had to pee so bad that <laughs> yeah. part of me wanted, but although I thought I might get injured. Although apparently didn't, <laughs> I, I peed before and I was good to go. I did too. But I peed before, but I still not so good to go. I actually have a funny and weird story. Uh, to are share. You gonna, are you going to tell Thomas? Do it. You shouldn't? You should know I'm saying do it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> I had to pee so bad, man, that like as soon as it cracked, we ran to the bathroom. The bathroom was full. We get in there, all the urinals are full. <clears throat> and I'm like starting to like wait in line for urine. I'm like, how could this be? This is so bad. How I, could this I, I might get injured. <laughs> like, and then my buddy Derek was in line behind me too. He had to pee so bad that after this all went down, he had like a cramp oh, from geez. like from holding it. Like <laughs> oh, that's how no. we had to pee so bad. And then I was like leaning on the wall. I was like, oh, there's a stall here. I'm just assuming it's occupied. But I like push it a bit with my hand and open an empty stall. Hell yeah. Oh. So I walk in there to go pee. And my buddy Derek is like, bro, bro. Like we're splitting this toilet. <laughs> so <laughs> what? Which is something normalized from. Our upbringing okay. seems very weird you, to you. You grew up with this guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This is like I mean, a grade 10 friend. I can sort of see that. I still would not do that with the people I grew up with, but yeah. Yeah, you know, sports great. players who like share showers and change rooms and shit. I, like James, I love that for you. We, we, it's not our first time splitting a toilet anyway. So it was so, but it was so funny because I started before him peeing. And then oh. he came in and started peeing and then delivered like a, like a new PR for him. <laughs> like it was for both of us. This was like a record breaking pee, but he kept being like, when are you going to stop? <laughs> because I started before him and also keep in mind, we're both ripped. And, <laughs> and okay. laugh, we're laughing. Like Jack. Like yeah, it, that it, like keep, <laughs> the peeing keeps going. So it becomes like a Peter Griffin style joke where, like, how is this going on for so long? And then in the end, he finished before me. I actually beat him. I had like two liters of pee in me. It was, it was hilarious. We're going to make this a chapter in the YouTube video. <laughs> so, like, if you want, you can skip then to the end. Derek leaves the stall before me on the way out. Still going. Naturally, somebody's <laughs> waiting to get in and they mm. see one man exit so they're like oh right. that's free dude goes to walk in he's like ah oh. yeah i didn't know this derek just told me after they're like what did i miss out on <laughs> and then i finally emerged and my eyes are like crying because i was cr <laughs> we were both crying laughter in there okay i heard you laughing and i'm like what is so funny yeah that must have been like what the fuck, fuck are those guys doing oh they'd rather god. didn't have any eyebrows <laughs> oh my god it was hilarious uh, and that's just for me. Amazing. 99% of people are just like, uh, my opinion heck? of James is changing now. But <laughs> I think it I was, don't care. It was, it so was a long movie. 
uh, two two hours and forty five. Is that what it was? Yeah. It flew by for me. I, I was worried was that it was gonna be like a slow, slow, slow thing. But it, it it moved. Were there any scenes where you're like, oh, okay, I don't need to see him like walking anymore? Well, it's tough because or another I've, vision because the movie's so good. I felt myself wanting more, and I wish that like you know I could go a little more in depth about everything. So it was my bladder talking. Yeah, okay. I, I think so. Uh, but the pacing of this movie is, I think, pretty on point. Yeah. Like it, it just it's it's deserves to be two hours forty five minutes. It's not. I think I, it's all every frame is earned. A hundred percent. There's nothing in this movie that's like that shouldn't be there. There's no deleted scenes. And I remember talking in the in the first episode where I was like, I hope there's a four hour director's cut because I just want to see so much more and I I love doing so much. But I subsequently heard Denis in an interview saying like he doesn't do deleted scenes. He doesn't do director's cuts. He makes the story like he makes the movie as long as it needs to be to fit the story, mm-hmm. and that is it. Mm-hmm. Well, I I very rarely find director's cuts better than the theatrical cuts. It's always interesting to see it, and like if there was a Dune cut, it'd be cool to see those scenes. But the theatrical cut will probably always be better. Well, Lord of the Rings though, uh, the theatrical cuts are better. Wow, <laughs> I know those Heresy. are funny words, Heresy. but I, I like those scenes. And I'm glad they exist, but a lot of them don't. They're deleted for a reason. Yeah. yeah. But I agree with you for Fellowship. The theatrical is better. And the other two, I like the other ones. But yeah. this I is about Dune. Yeah, it's true. Dune. <clears throat> I like the, I don't know if it's a metaphor or if there's a different word for it, but the visual of a tiny thing can control a titan if it just knows which scale to pull on. Oh. I think that's a, a good visual for like the the theme and the story of like, all it takes is just like a little a little cunning and you can control a giant beast. What are you talking about specifically? Are you talking about when the Bene Gesserit said that um, Fader Alpha's levers are desire well, I think and honor? I think that's a part or of it. Is that like there's this interplanetary conflict and it's all these little levers that are being pulled behind the scenes and it's there's very little of like these giant giant moves it's all people behind the scenes that are playing the game mm. uh but I, I i found it interesting that they lift the scale and it's like a nostril what are you talking about the sandworms they lift like the scale of the sandworm. oh yeah yeah yeah. how they steer oh. how they steer yeah 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 the nostril yeah i never thought of it like that <laughs> but yeah when he pulls up the scale there's like those little holes mm-hmm. i didn't i don't know what those and are it's, supposed to be that's another good example of like they just show it and they trust that the audience will understand what's happening. They don't need someone to be like, ah, oh, it's the sandworms. Awful. T-. Like, yeah, like yeah. It's, yeah. You just need someone. Everyone's going to be like, how do they even drive those things? Like, well, that one shot. Oh yeah. Okay. No, yeah. yeah. No. That's I would, enough. I would like them to explain how they got all those people up on the worm and like, uh, <laughs> and that and little Jessica, that litter, Jessica in the basket. That's called a litter, isn't it? Sure. It's yes. one of, that's when, one of when those, you carry a person yeah, in a basket. So. That's one of those details that's left to the uh, Dune encyclopedia. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good <laughs> to Dune trust Wiki. that if they had to explain it to us, there would be an explanation. But I liked oh, that shot of him the first time he's riding the or going to ride the sandworm and the dunes collapsing where the yeah, worm's going. Yeah, that's cool. And he's kind of like going down. Oh, that was so he's good. falling like yeah. man. He's falling like thirty feet onto yeah. this thing. Like he kind of screwed up. Yeah, and even like the 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 set pieces are so good and didn't even have so good at creating tension and releasing where it's like it the stakes are of every action piece are so clear but they there's just like there's just such good tense small and tension release and just the visceral nature of that scene when he's like getting pulled off and like i felt so immersed every time like there's a sand blast and like he's going through it and he kind of gets like loses his yeah. audio for a second and like i obviously i don't feel like the sand blast on my face but i i haven't been that immersed in a set piece in a movie because yeah, you can understand the long. physics because yeah. you're like oh it's like he's on a speeding train yeah i've kind of seen this yeah. in movies and, and then when he's like finally stood it's like he's water skiing you know yeah, like yeah. he's hold, have the tension in the ropes and his legs are squatting it's mm-hmm. like an athletic movement and you're like I, I could feel that sand hitting the goggles. It was, like, it was yeah, it was stri- exhilarating. So strenuous. Especially because so much of it is from like his perspective. Mm-hmm. We're like looking past him to like forward and like it hits the dune. It's like, it's like spray. It's like water spray. That like, shot it, though, when it, they break over the crust of the dune and oh, they're just in yeah. the sky and you get like the euphoria of riding yeah. the worm. I like, thought it was going to cut to the worm getting air. I was hoping he was gonna <laughs> like a whale. Yeah. No, yeah, I was hoping yeah, he was like, gonna pump his. Like hand the worm up. went off and oh, jumped. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> like three feet air that time. Free willing. Do a grab. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it has like a little flipper. It's like. Bang. <laughs> no, that would be James Cameron. Paul bonds this. with one worm in particular and calls <laughs> it Flipper. Yeah. Now this movie deserves <laughs> to make two point five billion dollars. Hell yeah! Do you think there'll be a third one? Yes, I think 
He's working I, on the script. Really? For and Dune, it's, it's Dune Messiah, him? the novel Dune oh Messiah, God. Dune 2. Is, uh, yeah. is Dune even have the rest of his career just going to be Dune movies? No. <laughs> because Dune Honestly, gets... Honestly... I think uh, Dune gets too fine. weird. I think it gets mm. too weird. Yeah, let's and talk about this. And like, this can't, this can't be done, so I'm out, and I've done enough of my life on Dune. Yeah. I don't think he's like a career, make a career out of this franchise kind of guy. So have, how many books have you read? Just two. I read the okay. Dune Messiah, the next one. I read Messiah, and then I read Children of Dune, which is three, and I have not God Emperor. God Emperor yet, because after Children of Dune, I was like, ugh, I don't know. But then apparently God Emperor of Dune is a really good read hmm. um, if you're down for things to get uh, wacky. I'm going to spoil for the next like 30 seconds. Let's talk spoilers of Wait, the book, that fourth book. Of which God Emperor? Yeah. But you haven't read it. I know, but I just know like one little factoid. I know quite a bit about it as yeah. well. So I'm just, let's just wow. go into that territory just it's for a sec. It's hard not to spoil because you guys like, can yeah. spit ahead. This is actually just going to be 30 seconds. Like Paul's son becomes the emperor for like 1500 years because he gets like so alpha. Mm. Um but then he also somehow becomes a human worm hybrid. Yeah. Well, that's why he can be emperor for that long. So, I see. and that's uh, what Paul was. I don't think even Denny can knock the cringe off that or like portray yeah. that on a film. In a I don't cool know. Way. Honestly, like, to, like seeing, can we like do, okay, wait, the spoilers are still happening. Guys, if you skip to this point, you came, there's still spoilers. Well, if you skipped ahead, <laughs> another still, 30. Yeah. yeah. Skip ahead another 30 seconds. Uh, seeing how well Denis executed on particularly some of the weird aspects of Dune uh, with these two movies. I I feel like by the time we get to movie f four or five or six or whatever it is, Maybe it'll seem well, okay. Well, in the 1984 Dune, they they show the spacer spacing guild. Are we are people. we done spoilers now? Um, yeah, I think if you're watching this point, you're probably okay, good to go. But you're good to go. I'm still kind of talking about that topic. In the 1984 Dune, you see the spacers, and they they don't look human at all. They're like these big floating like slugs that are in a tank of gas. Yeah. If he went tank of gas, kind of mystique <coughs> with mm. the thing we're talking about, I th maybe you could do. Yeah, maybe. Well, that one is, yeah, the, the, there's a, uh, there's one of these weird mutant people in the next book oh. in Messiah. Oh, the, f the face, what it, face dancer, face changer. No, that's, that's the Tlay Laxu or whatever. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's a different thing. They, there's like a plot. Oh, a spacing guild person. There's it? people plotting against Paul. Yeah. And one of them the is Tlay a Tlay Laxu are so cool. They I can't really wait to, cool. can't wait to see that if, if and when they make another one. He's working on the script, apparently, so there's going to be a part three or as whatever. As long as he is as passionate about that as he was about these two movies. Because there's always the danger of, you know, he's done it. And it's yeah. like, it's hard to keep that fire going. And didn't even have never disappointed. So, like, what am I saying right now? But it's still the third time it is always, happen. it could happen. Where he's just a little less enthusiastic and doesn't put as much passion Unless into it. Unless he felt like this one was one movie. That's fair. Maybe maybe it's, that plays a thing. I, don't I know. feel like it's clear that for Denis, my buddy Denis, this was like a, a work of passion. A hundred percent. Because they didn't even greenlight the second part. He will. He was like, I want. I want so bad. This is me projecting onto him. It seems like he wanted so bad to like do it right. I deeply he's, love it. He's like, in order for me to do it right, I have to do it in two parts. Mm -hmm. And they're like, we'll let you do the first one, and we'll see how it goes. The first one does well. And then they're like, okay, fine, we'll let you do the second one. He does it, knocks it out of the park yeah. again. That is sort of like Lord of the Rings. Remember, they were like, hey, this has to be four hours long. And then the studio was like, we'll see ya. And yeah. then another studio just happened to take a big gamble on them and let them right. film two at once. Weinstein. But, yeah, but no one had the balls like Weinstein in, t in 2020, <laughs> I guess. And they were just like, yeah, yeah. Ma make one and we'll see. Yeah. Honestly. Well, the greatest thing Weinstein peace, ever Weinstein. did... <laughs> Oh, I, let's get out of here. I, I'm kind of grateful that it feels like there's a little bit of a correction happening in cinema where the big, big movies are good. Like we, we missed it, but Barbenheimer, like yeah. that was yeah. the biggest cinematic event of the last year. And both those movies are great movies. Oh They're not gosh. just fucking Marvel movies. All the Marvel movies are crashing and burning. Nobody fucking cares. That's what I love them. more than anything about this damn movie and this saga is like it has dignity <laughs> it has dignity. Yeah. It's like practical shots. It's gravitas. Like my wife likes it. It's mm -hmm. sci-fi as hell and she likes it because it's not just like, yeah. like the Marvel movies. It, it, it has dignity. It takes itself no. serious. It's an adult movie. Yeah. Cinema. Well, I mean, I don't know if you'd call this, I would call it cinema. I, guess, I would call but it, it cinema. You know, it's a big blockbuster. I mean, they did make the flashlight popcorn ba ba basket <laughs> thing. <laughs> 
<laughs> but at least it's not going to be on like your Coke can. Yeah. Or is it? Yeah. I don't know. I don't really see Mark. It might like be, that. but that, that stuff doesn't really bother me because that's not related to the movie. You can just, you can tell when people are phoning it in and there's nothing about this movie. That's yeah. I, li- I like your point there, uh, David, because I didn't see Oppenheimer, but oh. yeah, Barbie blew me away. I was yeah. like, this is, I, I, it's one of my favorite movies ever. Man, my kids watch it on a repeat all the time. The yeah. first time my daughter saw it and she's four, she freaking cried. Uh, yeah, nuts, yeah. I cried for the first time I saw it too, and which was so unexpected because it's like, well, I guess it wasn't super expected, uh, super unexpected because I think what I love so much about that movie is how it like changes tone. Yeah. It can be hilarious and seem like an SNL skit, and then it's being super earnest and like it executes well on both. Yeah, and it's like I so unexpected, and it's it's one of those movies that studios can definitely take the wrong lesson from and they probably will like i know they're they greenlit a bunch of toy movies after that yeah 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 but like the lesson is that movie did well because it's a fucking good yeah. movie it's well, because of greta gerwig yeah yeah and this movie is good because of denis villeneuve yeah. it's it's trusting hey let's take an i, I don't know auteur let's take <gasps> someone with some freaking vision and let them yeah. create their vision and get out of the way yeah mattel was a great sport for that like they yeah. did so much self-deprecation in that movie mm-hmm. anyway this is the the yeah, dude now podcast, we're talking about Barmid Bar- Bar- yeah. Yo, how about speaking of like weaving between two worlds? The whole time, most of this movie, he's just trying to, you know, become the messiah and everything. But when he's doing that, and he whips out the signet ring, and Gurney's there, mm-hmm. and he's like, "No, I'm also an Atreides," and yeah. he like merges those two. That was mm-hmm. dope. Yeah, seeing and then, Gurney yeah, like Gurney get a loyalty boner in the crowd. Like, <laughs> east, it's East meets West. It is. Gurney was oh, an, an, at its core, right? Fremen versus, yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah. yeah, Gurney was a char- another character that I think I wish I could have seen more of. Because it's like, I was glad to see them again, but I feel like there's very little time to give me the like emotional buildup that felt like a big release. It was kind of more just, oh, it's cool to see him. And I'm like happy that he's here. But yeah. it, I didn't feel the same uh, emotional drive that I felt with other I'm characters. I'm pretty sure in the um, book, there are scenes with him and his, and his like uh, smuggler crew, like in their ship and stuff. That don't have Paul. Yeah, I like, also take some more time. Was curious because does when does Paul realize that it's him Gurney? after he blows up his ship? Yeah, why does he blow up his ship? Then? He comes up and goes face to face with it's him. That, on the it's literally right yeah, there. Then he realizes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I rem- I, f- I felt like that sequence was a little bit strange to me because I I didn't really understand at that point. I didn't know why Gurney had all this cool tech. Like, because it's still like a pretty substantial ship or. Yeah. Tank the writing. Well, they were, um, and yeah, I still like don't really get, I, 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 it feels strange to me that the, uh, Her- 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 <coughs> what are they called? Harakins? Harkon- Harkonnens. Harkonnens. Uh, have such, are, you know, laying siege to this planet and yet these smugglers can kind of just chill and steal some spice. Well, it's a big planet. I guess. Yeah. And, and the North, you know, they, they do all just, the spice harvesting. There's no computers. In like one Spicing in the deep desert isn't as common because okay. there's bigger yeah. worms and more storms and danger down there. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, everyone's busy. Mm-hmm. And um, he's also saying like there's a, sh- it's super lucrative mm. to do it. Yeah. And there's all these like, I think the scenes, if I recall correctly, the scenes, uh, they talk more about the trade of it and like how they, who they sell it to and like how that's illegal, but mm. they're still buying it. So yeah, yeah. I think that's one of the, things I don't think the movie succeeded at was making the planet feel huge. It didn't feel really. Yeah. It, it feels big, but it doesn't feel like immense. Mr. Worldwide. Yeah. I feel like it's <laughs> well, like having read the book, I feel like the movie does a better job of making the planet feel like a, like a big planet with, mm. because in the book, they don't even have that whole thing with like, Oh, the South of the planet and like the, the desert. storm wall or whatever. They the mostly de- just talk about the deep desert. Yeah. Mm. They, but they're not talking about like, Ooh, the desert down there, the sand is, is harder than like, you know, like, and, and the vi- visually in the movie, it was different. It was like darker and, mm-hmm. and coarser and stuff. And yeah, that's not really in the book. I think I did get the sense that the South was, like much much harder to live in and i think that that was cool like you know it's in on <clears throat> that scene i think it was the emperor and or whoever it was and it's like it's uninhabitable it's filled with humans like yeah, what the fuck yeah. are you talking about yeah. and it says but no one can live down here without faith yeah, yeah, yeah i liked the justification for why the fundamentalists are down there yeah yeah because you have to believe in something speaking of which when uh, paul like is having that conversation with jessica and she's like they're kind of arguing about the prophecy and she's like, we gave them something to hope for. And he says, that's not hope. And I, I, I love that theme of this movie that Mm. it's kind of like, 
it's 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 definitely a central theme that Chani is like knows that these prophecies were planted, mm. and so she she can't go along with them. Uh, and so does Paul, and he does. But you know, but he but Paul wants to earn it, right? Yeah, and I think there's some some of that like hanging on from the first movie where he's like. I don't want to be part of your plan for the sake of being part of your plan. You know, like I'm not, I'm not going to just go along with it. Yeah. He wants to kind of like make it happen. If, if his own way F- finds his, he wants to find his I way. I found like my way dad. to it. Yeah. That's what he says to his yeah. dad. Yeah. Um, that was great. But I, I love that one of the central questions the book asks is if there's value in false hope, like, mm. like the prophecy is fake, but so like when you tell people like, hope in the promise of this Messiah coming to save you. Knowing that it's fake, can you still have, well, like, yeah, but I love that. that it's not, but it, it simultaneously is not fake. Like the dude does miracles. Right. He didn't, he was a man who didn't die from drinking the blue juice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah right. Yeah. And they know from like empirically men die when they drink this. He doesn't, he, yeah. that's literally a yeah. miracle. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy then. So they, it makes it not fake. It started as propaganda, but they really were trying to breed yeah. these super right. humans. And I, I like that the movie doesn't give a definitive answer on is false hope bad or good. <laughs> yeah. Because I think there's a reading of the movie where you can be like the good guys won and you know, the prophecy is good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but then there's a reading of the movie where it's like, well, it's a little more complex than that. Yeah. Well, that's like he always says 60 trillion dead. You know, yeah. he sees those emaciated yeah. people starving to death I that feel shot like, of the person like screaming yeah, on the like, ground oh. it almost looks like in it, on it, like a not a human it's yeah. shocking i don't know the way the face yeah, was yeah. contorting i liked the change in paul's characterization after he awakens from the uh, water of life mm-hmm. coma thing yeah he where, really felt different yeah he felt like you i don't know how much of that was his performance and how much of it was like you know the the editing and kind of just the shot choices and stuff but i think timothy chalamet did a good job and i i think that uh i got a real sense that he was sort of like magnetically drawn towards uh fulfilling this prophecy after that like before he's still really struggling with it and he has that vision Again, I think it's a bit cheesy how like you hear the voices being like, "You must get yourself. You must drink the water of life. Uh, drink the water, uh, Paul. It's, it's us, the ghosts. It has electrolytes. Yeah, <laughs> it's what plants need, um, <laughs> or what plants crave. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, after that, after that point, it, like, and yeah, the whole scene where he goes up into the meeting and he's like yelling in in uh, in the language and stuff is just. So powerful. I was ready to join up. That's what I was saying. I was yeah. in the crowd, man. Yeah. Cause he can see it at that point. Mm-hmm. He can see it and he just acknowledges this is the least bad path. It's <laughs> the only way. So let's just go. Yeah. I think I, I think the movie does a pretty good job making me feel like the ending is his choice, but I think there, it would have been served if there was a little more time in between him making a choice and a drug pushing him to the limit of that choice. Cause I think that it happens almost a little too quick for me where it almost feels like the drug is more responsible for the ending than his choice. Well, it kind of is though, because the drug gives him like, after he does that, I, you know what? I don't think that they do say that, Oh, I can see the future and the past now. But I think that like in the book, it's, it's a lot more of like a revelatory movement moment. And it's kind of mind blowing because it describes him basically being able to be like, omniscient Mm. like he can know about stuff that's happening on the other side of the planet is that and that's because he's so smart he can well or is is, well the other thing is he's part he's part meant like he's a mentat as well so he can calculate shit to like insane Mm. because because there's like fight scenes and shit in the book where he goes like oh the air pressure in this room yeah is such that the this this curtain is gonna fly this way and yeah it, yeah it's, well it's it's, it's like oh, it's I really micro to, I was trying to look it up earlier I forget I think you made a reference to it in in the first podcast we did but like there's a philosophical idea like there's a concept uh, about like uh, theoretically if you had all the information oh yeah nothing's yeah. random a deterministic universe yeah hmm. did, yeah but there's a specific term like some some hypothetical idea. 
anyways, whatever. It's like it's like so and so's box or whatever. It's like it's like one of those. I forget what it's called. But the the idea is that theoretically, if you had all of the information in the universe, you could make predictions perfectly. Mm. Um, it's a ter- deterministic idea. But the idea is that he can do that so that and like light spoilers for Dune Messiah. Not really. Um, there's people having a meeting on another planet and that's actually why that guild navigator is part of the meeting because the guild navigator being also sort of prescient disrupts Paul's ability to sense to see what what's they're doing. going on. Yeah. So like the, the implication is that if they didn't have a navigator there, he would know they're having that meeting and what mm. they're talking about. Yeah, I don't understand. The lore kind of breaks down for me at that point because I get the whole like child chasing a ball kind of thing. Sure. But what, like, how does he see the past? I don't know. So I think that that's why I think the spice is sort of like a supernatural element because it brings in. It brings in it's like. It's not mushrooms, it's DMT. He's going to another plane. <laughs> well, it's as if, like I said this in the last one, you guys were joking about like how it actually does that or whatever, but like it's as if DMT or mushrooms or whatever actually gave you access to some deeper level of reality mm-hmm. instead of just making you think that you are. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's like a theory that all the dimensions do exist at the same time. And so, right. you know, time does exist. So maybe, yeah, it, it allows him to access that other dimension that yeah. normally we see in one, one, one line. And. That actually brings me to a question I had from this one. There's two points at which a Benny Gesserit appears to just be using telepathy. They like, don't have telepathy? They're not supposed to just have telepathy. Oh. That's not real. Oh. I don't remember. Um, just like talking to each other. You don't remember minds? whether there's supposed to be telepathy? Well, they definitely have it. Like, Jessica definitely has it with Aaliyah. Yeah. But, like, yeah, there's a couple times in this movie where, like, Helen Gaius Mohim looks at Jessica and they're just like talking with their eyes. Is it with Aaliyah? That never occurred to me. Yeah, she's in her womb. Like she, she, she's hearing the fetus talk. The fetus doesn't have a mouth or lungs yet. Like, how is she hearing her thoughts? Yeah, to, to that's, that's a great question. Yeah, it's a belt cord, baby. It's got a, a <laughs> axons in it, myelin sheath. I liked. Uh, the when they command what is it called when they command people the voice the voice i think the amount of times it's used every time is powerful and when a tr- when paul does it it was like oh fuck yeah 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 because he he i heard down, your reaction yeah. in the movie one time like someone used the voice and you were like fuck yeah because well, he makes the <laughs> the like lady the benny jesuit lady like sit down oh yeah, yeah that was when like, she calls him an abomination yeah and he's because he uses it on her and he's yeah. like silence yeah that, that was, was awesome that was good shit <clears throat> um no apparently they're like it, it's not supposed to be actual telepathy in dune it's it is in the movie <laughs> definitely is unless in the we movie. saw the wrong read on our part oh, maybe i want it well riley well, looks that's why into i was that. confused no i'm uh, i'm i'm sure now that like i i thought that there was no telepathy before and i know that oh what while he learns on that, I want to delete on you for actors' names once more because that badass woman from the James Bond movies who remember the the latest James Bond? Mm-hmm. He's in love with that chick, and oh, she, she's uh, blonde, and she looks like a Bond. spy and has a sweet European accent, and oh, she's in this movie as that um, as that Benny Jesuit. Why can't I think of her name? I, I feel on like Gaiety Prime. I'm so embarrassed. And she like the way that she gets faded. Yes, I do. She gets Fader Alpha to do the Gom Jabbar, oh, put your hand yeah. in this box, but she does it through seduction. Yeah. I was like, wow, that's really cool. Just the contrast between that and how Paul went through it yeah. through like ceremony and obligation. Yeah. Um, it was just, that was really cool to see the Benny Jesuit have like aims and different means to those ends. Do you, so, I mean, they're always playing Paul, like the Benny Jesuits are playing him. So I guess like based on how they, <laughs> are playing or they, they even are so explicit in how they describe how they're going to manipulate Austin Butler. Do you think that conversation happened with Paul? And like, what would you say is like the words they used to be like, what's the levers Mm. they pull use with Paul? I don't know because she seemed more kind of hung up on the fact that he was not supposed to exist. Mm. Um, And they were kind of just like seeing what he could do. Yep. They did test, they tested him. Um, And they, they don't hope they plan, like she said. So I guess they would have had, wanted to control him should he advance. Yeah. So I don't know what they would be. Um, you know, maybe revenge. Maybe. But a shout out, 
speaking of Leisuru, that scene where the fireworks are blasting outside after his celebration or whatever, and it's just like the light, it's lighting up the interior in the different spots. Yeah. Incredible. Oh, Incredible yeah. shot. <laughs> that was uh, visually very... Yeah. <clears throat> um, apparently, I mean, I think that uh, when Frank Herbert was writing the book, he didn't want there to be telepathy. But I think that like the implication is that like at least at the very least in the in the case of Aaliyah in Jessica's womb, there's no other way that it what it could be other than telepathy unless it's like <clears throat> they're both prescient in a certain way. So then they are like perfectly predicting what the other person is thinking. And so they're sort of communicating that yeah, way. Yeah, sure. It, it, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that um, you get the idea like that, at least in the first one and probably in this one as well. Like when that uh, in the Herald of the Change, like chapter in the first one, you really love that chapter. The Re Reverend Mother's there and like Jessica's like staring at her. and She's doing that thing where she's wordlessly communicating a lot. Yeah. And you get the sense that you don't hear any whispering or telepathy there, but you get the sense that they're having a conversation. Yeah. I think that like uh, just just from like the way they look at each other. It seems it seems like in the Dune movie universe, there's got it. There's got to be telepathy of some kind. Yeah, it, maybe it appears that way. Yeah, maybe it's one of those things. They're just reading each other so well, and that's for the sake of the audiences to hear it. But like, really, it's just them reading each other. I don't know. I don't know. Someone will make a Reddit thread about this, and we can get to the bottom of it. Um, one of my last like main points I had here was, well, actually, no, I have, I have another one, but <laughs> the Harkonnen revelation, the revelation that um, they're Harkonnens. Uh, uh, how did you feel about that? Did you know I'm, that? I'm No, I had no idea that was a thing. Uh, and I'm guessing it pays off more later. Well, they kind of paid off here because... He says cousin. Um, I, did, like, I, I like when he kills the emperor and he's like... Thanks, Grandpa. <laughs> yeah. It was cool, but it doesn't really feel like it's come full circle or fully, they fully explored the, the, the ramifications of what that means. Yeah, you know what? I kind of forget what the reasoning is for like including that or how or why it's important in the book, like how that kind of changes. Like, obviously it's a shock. Yeah. But I'm like, what is that? How does that change the the vibe other than just kind of like, oh my God. Well, what? well there's a, there's... Obviously, his own personal feelings were that they are their sworn enemies, and he's trying to get revenge mm -hmm. for his father, and so that that's all brutal and makes it more complicated. <clears throat> um, but I think it also kind of speaks to is Paul rightful, you know, to be the Quizar Tadarach? Because um, like they're trying to their their design was it to be the child of Fader Alpha, right? So right. obviously that the Baron's in that bloodline. Um, yeah. So it's kind of like well. At least we got this one. It's close. Yeah. So maybe the Reverend Mother can live with that a bit. In the book, the Harkonnen revelation happens when they first, Jessica and Paul first flee into the desert after the attack on the Atreides and they're in the tent and he's kind of like getting a dose of the spice and he's like having visions and stuff. And that happens in the first movie, but uh, in the book, that's where he has the Harkonnen really? revelation. Yeah. Wow. And <clears throat> in the in the movie... Does he get it just from looking at his mom's face and seeing like the shape of her chin or something? No, I think I think he 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 realizes it after he has the awakening from the water of life because now he's basically omniscient. So he like he went back into it, their their bloodline in the yeah, past. Yeah, in the and, book though, I mean. Uh, maybe. I, don't I seem know. to remember something about a chin. But did do you guys feel like in there the was movie a chin involved? It it <laughs> was paid off. Like the well, what I like about uh, how they did it in the movie is I like it being revealed later, mm -hmm. and I like that he says, "So yeah, you're a Harkonnen," and he's like, "Did you know?" And he's like, "I didn't know." What'd she say? I didn't know until you just told me. She didn't know until she had her. She had her wing. Oh yeah, yeah, right, right. <clears throat> um, and then he says. So we're Harkonnen, Har Harkonnens then. It's like, so we're, so we're going to, he says, we're going to be Harkonnens then or something to that effect. And then that kind of like informs why he's like, okay, let's go beast mode. Like, let's go. Yeah. Like, let's, let's fucking. Is it, is it meant to be like when you put him beside Fader Alpha, you know, we're not so different after all. Maybe. I, I actually thought at some point, maybe the story was taking the direction that the, 
the the prophecy would flip and it would be Austin Butler's character that was start going to start fulfilling the prophecy. Oh. And that's going to be the level uh. of the battlefield was going to be this like this faith, like this faith war where it's like there's two mm. messiahs. Right. Uh, but obviously I was wrong. Yeah. Um, and so I thought that it was going to become a much more important thing than just mm. informing the choice for Paul to go beast mode. Yeah, it does. It does seem like, yeah, it just seems kind of like a weird thing to throw in there. But I like, you know, because this wasn't in the book. I do like how Denis kind of like used that as motivation because up till that point, Paul is sort of like, I don't know, like, am I the Messiah or not? I don't know, mom, you know, like, and then once he realizes they're Harkonnens, he's like, all right, let's fucking be Harkonnens. Let's go fucking trash the town. I think there's lots of things you could include or not include from the books. Then people can get mad that you include them or not, didn't include them. But at least this inclusion, though it might seem service level, it enhances or increases the the stakes like the emotion mm. the emotion right yeah it just puts this extra flavor on it you know? yep. and i think i i mean if anything if nothing else it i think it highlights the kind of treachery of the Bene Gesserit yeah and the fact that they're pulling all these strings and some people aren't even aware and well, i mean yeah. most people aren't aware but and it's it's tied into his <clears throat> narrative arc again where it's like everything's a plan within plans within plans they say plans within plans so many times in the book but they only dropped it once mm. in this movie saga yeah Oh man, may your blade chip and shatter. And then I, I actually but, like that when Austin, Austin Butler says it back. May your knife chip and shatter. When yeah, he exactly. said it back, I was like, you couldn't think of your own thing. But I, I guess think, it, it speaks to the honor yeah. thing you're talking about. I think it was like when when Paul said it, I was like, fuck yeah, let's go. And then it cuts to Fade Ratha and he's like, yeah, that's yeah. cute. I guess I'll just say it back to you. Whatever, let's fight. You know, I I I, like, I, I actually he, got the sense it was a more of like a I'm I'm actually like. He has some reverence. Respect. Yeah, oh, reverence. Really? Yeah. I don't know. It, yeah, it, I, I agree. didn't get that, but, but I, I can see how you, yeah. Fairy Alpha, they, you know how like they're, the Harkonnens are just gross in every way, including me like pederast, like Fairy Alpha just like smooching the Baron and the implication that they, <laughs> they had like some kind of um, so re- funny. sexual relationship. Wait, really? Oh, I just thought it was like, oh, you know, they just kiss I, on the lips. I thought that was just no, like a part cultural of the, thing. That's part of the book too. Ew. Part of the book is that the Baron like, Fucks everything. Has like fourteen year old boy. He he has like boy prostitutes and like kills them. Well, yeah, yeah. They They kill everything. What's Faye Redden? Faye Ralpha. Ralpha. He. I. I don't know how I. If I really loved his character introduction, where he's just like slicing throats and stuff. I was like, yeah, okay. I. I I just didn't land for me. I think as hard as it could have. They're just so evil. Why are they like? I just. It's hard for me to imagine the Nazi imagery. They even have those like blimps. Remember yeah. they zoomed out and had everybody like, yeah, yeah, yeah. we just crowned the new. Yeah. I just, it's Fira. hard for me to imagine like a whole <laughs> culture that's just like that brutal. Brut- the brutality of it. Yeah. I don't know. But like, I don't think that's in the book. It's hard to say though, because they have like, they had that other guy, like that Lieutenant who's explaining to him like how bleak the situation is. And then he just ends up smashing his head so many times. Raban is smashing Raban. that dude's head so many times. And that character was like the first Harkonnen to like say a paragraph. He used mm. to like speak. Fade Ratha? No, no, no. This guy who gets his head smacked. He just, oh. he talked like way more words than yeah. any Harkonnen had. Oh. I'm like, okay. So I guess they're like a society with a range of personalities. Yeah. 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 And we've just only seen this, like the leaders of it who yeah. are, who get that way from being brut- brutal. Yeah. So, yeah. so maybe they're not all like Raban. Mm. Um, Dave Bautista, I feel like, I don't know. No, you didn't buy, it, buy in? He feels out of place in this. I don't agree. I, I enjoy him when he kisses the boot. I feel like he did a good job being threatening yet pathetic. Yeah, he turned tail and ran that time. Yeah. I think he kind of maybe had too much screen time. Yeah, like the way he's fair. used, he's a great actor mm-hmm. and he can lead a movie, but the way he's used in Denis movies, including Blade Runner, is very sparingly. And you're like, he, he just becomes like a chameleon in this world mm-hmm. and he totally fits in. But then, in, and then the, that is true of Dune one, but then in this one, he's just on it for so long that his like screaming at people stick kind of loses yeah. its edge and gets every tiresome. Time, every time he screams, I'm just like, yeah, but in Dune one, he only has like two scenes and he's screaming at people and you know, and you're like, yeah. oh, oh, wow, that's scary. But in this one, you're like, man, can you just like tune it down? Like, let's have a conversation. I felt, I felt like that in the first one. Oh, like okay. when he when we first see him on Gaty Prime and they go up and they're like talking to the Baron in like his uh, space sauna. And he just like screams and is yeah. like, they, they didn't respect us. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. Why did you give like, it to that Duke? Yeah. And I'm just like, I don't know. It just felt like 
it felt like we're like, oh, we gotta we gotta make this character interesting in some way. Why don't mm. you just scream your line? Like I don't know. And it's like he doesn't sound good when he screams. I'm I'm not scared of him. It sounds like Dave Bautista. I am scared. Uh, I was scared of that. Okay, you'd be scared in person. I think also huge. Like compared to Fade, like I feel like it was he was not very compelling in the first movie, and then in this movie he's not very compelling, and it gets even less compelling once we see Fade Rotha and. Mm-hmm. Like Dave Bautista is not doing an accent; he's just being Dave Bautista. Uh, Fade, uh, 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 what's his name? Fuck, Dustin. Austin Butler comes Austin. in. Austin Butler comes in, and he's just like, I don't know. Like, I feel bad for Dave Bautista because Austin Butler comes in and does like a perfect Stellan Skarsgård impression, and it makes sense because they're both in the same family. So it like makes sense that they have the same accent and Dave Bautista has a completely different one. I don't know. I feel like you, I could explain it, you know, in the world where you know, Dave Bautista is the dumb cousin or nephew or whatever. And he yeah. can't, he doesn't match up. Whereas Austin Butler has spent his life trying to match this energy. Yeah. He didn't so get the memo that you're supposed to talk like you have a yeah. s- Swedish or whatever yeah. accent. I think to me, the big failure is that they don't really pay off the storyline with him super well. Like he, the the trainer guy gets to kill him. That was dope. That like, Gurney got to kill good him. Death, but I I I felt Did like they fight be- in the first one. Uh, I, they must have. have. No, no, because Gurney, Gurney Gurney just runs into the action and then he's gone. Well, he never yeah, gets okay. close to Raban. Yeah, yes. Gurney because Gurney makes a big deal in this one. It was like he, Raban gave me this scar, and I'm yeah. like, did we see that? Or was no, that no, no, no. Yeah. Childhood. Raban like killed his parents and family, but he was like a child who was who survived. Oh, yeah. yeah, that was one of the few moments I felt like the movie was trying to make me feel something, and I didn't quite feel it mm. when he was a child. Am I wrong? Raban is he younger his, than Gurney. I don't know. They're Harkonnens, man. He looks weird. <laughs> he does look younger than Gurney. I could be wrong, but I felt like I think Raban is definitely younger than Gurney. Well, what do I know? No, <laughs> yeah, just um, I was gonna say though, Fade Ralph. Okay. There's because the Harkonnens are like evil by every dimension. I don't know what it says about the about the heterosexism of this movie or whatever, but the fact that uh, Fade Rotha like he looks at at Paul like he's has like a big heart on for him, kind of like the, okay. like the bisexualness is like a, is part of the part well, of the I mix. Don't know, I don't know if that was intentional or if it was meant to be like a a reverent look like mm. it was like a, I can't like I'm actually someone that I can like respect mm. I think that for I think it Ra- looks kind of lusty I and don't we know disagree, that he's, yeah. and we know that he's like a sexual being yeah mm. so I think, I, that I think for, that's intentional I think that for him the blood lust and the sex lust probably are very interlinked that's yeah right. interlinked interlinked <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, other words they say in that sequence that we can't recall yeah he he <laughs> He he comes off as oh, a I'm wearing my favorite shirt, by the way. Shout out. Oh Shout out. wow. Anyways. But that's from Blade Runner. Oh, is it? It's a Wallace. I forgot whether what's the thing from Alien? Oh, yeah, I forget. Uh, that's, I, that's that's what I thought it was. Um Yeah. Uh friggin' Fade Rotha like laughing while he like laughing while uh, the pseudo Yua has like yeah. the knife like pointing at his face and he's sadistic right like when he yeah. was gonna kill that fremen woman and he's like oh it's just pleasure now yeah 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 um guns they get to use them in this because they go into the deep desert where you can't have shields on there's so be- many guns because the shields attract the worms mm. in the book they barely they don't i don't think they even describe guns other like they talk about las guns and how like you're not supposed to use it with shields and and, and stuff like that but like other than that there's there's like no mention of guns in the book. I don't know, remember, but they, I love they, the guns in this movie. They mention a Maula pistol. I think the uh, Fremen have these little pistols. And we see Chani use that in the final battle. They go, <laughs> and then like they're stabbing mm. people. But um, yeah, there's so many. I, I don't know. Kind of, I was kind of like, it makes sense. Because like, I'm like, how are they going to do, how, how are they going to explain this? But now I feel like they'd opened up a can of worms where I'm like, <laughs> hey. why does everyone use swords still in the desert? Everyone should just have guns all the time. Yeah. True. But they're heavy. And they do. They have las guns like crazy. And like those big uh the the spice harvesters aren't shielded and they wait until they they wait until uh Chani and um Paul take out the ornithopter with the with the shoulder mounted thing. That was a great sequence. Before they shoot the That's that was my question. The spice they have harvester. these super lasers that can destroy the spice harvesters in one blow. Yeah. What? Why aren't they using it all the fucking time? Maybe they're really expensive. 
Well, they do. <laughs> it, it cuts. There's a montage where yeah, it shows it, them like doing more attacks and stuff, and like there's ornithopters circling and stuff, and they do just shoot the the harvester first with the las gun. I'm like, las gun seems oh. And why doesn't the harvester just have a shield? It's attracting worms anyway. I think we'd need a free. A, I think it'd be a big shield. It's a rare drop. That's why they only get dropped in the desert like once a once a week. It's like a video game. Uh, it's a video game. Uh, I think that the um, <laughs> I know that the shields they don't just attract the worms. They make them crazy, and so maybe yeah, the, they maybe, drive them into a frenzy. maybe the worms would come faster or something. And you make less money. Yeah, maybe. But it is weird that the front of the movie is is loaded with guns and the back is not. I didn't even think about it, man. I was just like, I love the way they're using the guns. I love these people getting sniped out. Yeah. These scenes were so intense. I'm a like, big fan of the just guerrilla like warfare. A quiet was great. Glass breaking and someone falling over, yeah, and you're like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about that sequence that you said was so great when he's using the parallax of the moving leg to like run oh, to hide yeah. from the ship. And then it like, yeah, he's like, okay, I got to do this like sprint for my life. My goal here is the guns to shoot at me, but I don't get hit by the guns. Okay. Yeah. This is going to be tough. Yeah. And then as he starts running, then the leg moves like shit. Oh, I, <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah. yeah. I, I love that whole sequence. I, my, my, uh, suspension of disbelief kicked in or whatever. The opposite of that kicked in when, they didn't hit him because we had just had they a whole a, sequence of like they just they it shoots such a big barrage of bullets or whatever that like it takes a second and that person's dead, 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 yeah. dead, dead. And then that one fires like three, four seconds around him well, and never hits him once. And that's what was so interesting. I love those guns. I love They're those cool. uh, ornithopter mounted guns because it's like it's like a long range shotgun. It's like it's like yeah. flechette or whatever. Um, and uh I was like, okay, there's trade-offs here because you get a wide area of effect for your for your shot, but it's super inaccurate. Yep. So I I kind of believed that he they could like sure. fire at him and not have him get hit because in all those scenes where they're like mowing down people, it's like a big group of people. And That's going, fair. Yeah. 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 Also, you know, he's omniscient, so he wasn't omniscient <laughs> at that point. Yet, yeah. He knows where the wind's going to be taking that helicopter where he needs to dip and doodle. You know. He's only prescient. <laughs> He's not omniscient then. Uh, they got that atomic. That's everywhere at once. Huh? No, he's not he's not omnipresent. I said pres prescient. Prescient. Yeah. That's like you can see the future. Oh. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I misheard you. Mm. Um How do we feel about Shadam? Shadam? What are we, nitpicks? Nitpicks. <laughs> it's not a it can't be a nitpicks. ten because my nitpicks, I think my only issues with this movie are casting and Christopher Walken. I, I feared from the when I heard that he was in this movie, I was like, but is he going to be Christopher Walken? Because I don't know if I want Christopher yeah. Walken in this. But if he's, I liked him in Severance. So mm -hmm. I was, I was like, maybe he can get far enough away from like the meme cowbell walking <laughs> that it'll be sweet. And I won't like know that I'm watching Christopher Walken. Uh, nope. Baron. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Baron. Yeah. Good night. Moon. He, he doesn't <laughs> speak very much. A lot of it is just like, you know, yeah. this quiet broken man. Uh, I, I, I think that's a moment that as an audience, I felt like I was not let in on what the emperor was thinking. Uh, like I didn't really know what if he had regret or if he was like this is part of the plan. Like yeah. I, I wish I had been let in on his mindset a little bit more. But maybe yeah, and I, given given reasons to to be like, whoa, oh, that's why he's emperor. Yeah, you know? I wish that they cast uh, some of these roles with lesser known 100%. actors because like. The Emperor didn't need to be Christopher Walken. Irulan didn't need to be Florence Pugh. But she was good. She's good. She she's was, always she was good. Fine, she's but like, fucking awesome. But I, I agree. Oh, <laughs> well, I, I like her. Yeah, but like, I get why they have to fill big franchises with big actors. But I miss, or I just enjoy being like seeing that person as the character, not oh, it's Florence Pugh as this princess. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, I totally. That is just that princess. Hundred percent agree with you. But I think that they uniquely well did this <laughs> <laughs> opposite of my speaking i think that they like they managed to thread the needle we're like we're gonna get a like triple a list or superstars and they're still believable and like mm. they're the perfect ones for these roles although i'm not sure about the austin butler i'm split i think there's moments where he's fantastic if it hadn't been for elvis coming out yeah <laughs> if he had never yeah. been elvis it yeah. would have been all right yeah my uh my hit pick is the the gravitas that the that Rebecca Ferguson shows at the la the soul of lakes lakes of souls, but my nitpick is it's just like it it feels like it's just destroyed the next scene. 
I feel like it's so destroyed so quickly after it didn't f I didn't feel emotionally engaged on that being destroyed. It's bigger than a nitpick. Sorry. <laughs> well, I'm confused. So Lake of Souls, there's yeah. a scene where they're like explaining what it is. They show you person being dehydrated. Yeah. Water being poured in and they're like, don't drink it. That's souls. And she has <laughs> she has her moment of like, like, holy shit, this is such a big deal. I think that's effective to make it be like, this is like an important thing. But then we don't see it again until it's being destroyed. And I didn't really feel much. Oh, really? Watching it being destroyed. I think that whole that whole sequence and, and its destruction just serves to give depth to the Fremen. We're like, mm. yeah. They're, they're not just like hiding in dirt holes. Mm. Like they have these temples, like they have these amazing cities uh, and then you see it fall. Yeah. And, then, and they have these rituals as well. I felt something when I saw the rocks like falling into the water and having it like splash everywhere. And I'm just fair. like, it's ruined. I don't know. I, I did feel something. Yeah. Um, it was that, that pond was like a cemetery. Yeah. Well, and it's also like the seed of life for the future of the planet. Which I thought yeah. that was cool that he explained it like, oh yeah, that's okay. gonna be you know that's gonna feed the the resurrection of this planet. Okay, I was wondering because I'm like, I knew that they kept large like cisterns or whatever, um, but I thought that when they like when people died and they took their water, I thought it like went into the it was used. I yeah. thought they used it. I think they would if they were like. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, he said they're even off if, in the deep desert and they're trying to survive. They well, he said even if we were all, we were starving, we would never drink this. Well, from the pool, like he wouldn't walk up to that pool and drink. Probably out of not it. that sanitary. It might be the best water. I don't know. They said that they there's some water they use just for machinery, and some water they would drink. Well, yeah, I thought that was an interesting detail when they're dehydrating the Harkonnens, and they're like, oh yeah, it's only good for cooling systems because it's full of chemicals. Yeah. But then the next one, they dehydrate people, and they don't use. I was like, oh, maybe they drink themselves. Yeah, yeah. But no, they just don't use anybody. Also, so cool. This is another thing that like shakes your colonial mindset. Is like they have technology they have all this like filtration technology yeah yeah they, um i guess the tendency and i think this is like part of the book really and especially how the harkonnen see the fremen where you're like oh they're they're savages they're mm -hmm. not developed mm -hmm. right um but they have these still suits they they don't have like cell phones they put all their brain power into like surviving in the desert flourishing yeah. in the desert so they have advanced technology it's just they have different priorities than you so they have different technology than you yeah and they can e just equal but different yeah it definitely like I have to wrap my brain around the the fact that this is like these are like tribes in the desert or whatever, but they clearly have some sort of some sort of like modern manufacturing ability. It's kind of like Wakanda, but more subtle. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Wakanda light, like they have they have, but like the technology that they have would seem primitive to the rest of the galaxy at the or the universe at this yeah. point. Is I guess it a, so. It's a universe. No, it's a galaxy. They that, keep calling they, it the Dune universe. Well, but they, like, they say that the that um, the Padisha, Padisha Emperor is the ruler of the known universe. They say that. But like, there's no way that there's multiple galaxies. Like they're stretched across galaxies. Yeah, I mean, yeah there's well, no they, way. Well, they have faster than light travel. Yeah, Still. but even with faster than light travel, you did take you ridiculous amount of time to get between galaxies. D depends. Maybe how they how just much faster? Maybe than they light? just teleport. They have wormholes. Do they? Don't they? That's what the guild navigating is, isn't it? No. Or is it just is it just traveling at light speed through the stars? Yeah, they like plot. I don't think they go in another no, dimension dude, or anything. No, but there's a shot in the first one. Remember when you see the shot of their spaceship oh in space, and this big spaceship is kind of just looks like a tube, and then the mm. little the their little ships come out of it. They go yep. and they like get transported. I only noticed on my last watch. Oh, they do teleport. Riley, listen, this is yeah, cool. Yep. When you watch in the first one, you can look through that tube, and what you see through the tube is the other space. It's that you can cool. see Caladan. Is it Caladan? <laughs> You can see the Atreides' home planet through the tube, oh. but outside of it, they're in around oh, Arrakis. Oh, really? Yeah, that's yeah. fucking cool. Oh, okay. So it's really like a um, like a hole in space. But yeah, they they do uh, fold space, so they there you go. It's essentially teleporting. Well, that's I not happening around. until someone folds a piece of paper and shoves a piece of a pen through it. Yes, McConaughey does. Yeah, it. thank you. Hey, Interstellar yeah. is this? Universe. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Dune lore is is hard because there's the stuff that is revealed in the core books and then frank herbert died and his son wrote a ton more and he was like i'm and way he, more into fantasy fantasy yeah and he added so much more stuff like there are psychics in uh the kind of like dune prequels and stuff that his son wrote mm -hmm. and i'm like well if there's psychics like in the 
past. Why don't we see any of the psychic powers used? Anyways. So yeah, they fold. They teleport. That's cool. That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, I have a hit pick. The, we already talked about like them kissing on the mouth, but then like I feel like that they kiss in the they kiss in the mouth, and then he's like, "No, come back here," and then he kisses him again, and then he like looks at the the crowd, and they <laughs> the Harkonnens all do this like the like, thunderclap thing. <laughs> this I is saw their, that. This is how they cheer. They do like this, and I'm like. It made me laugh, and I'm like, it's so, like, it, it's perfect. I feel like it's perfect for the Harkonnens. They're like, they're fucking weird. They're weirdos. Mm, yeah. Like, they're just wacky. As a hit pick? Yep. Yeah. I got a nit. I got a nitty one for you. I don't know about Anya Taylor Joy. Yeah, bad feeling. I, I, I had a bad enjoy feeling it. about this. And I actually felt this with Furiosa as Same. well. We watched the Furiosa trailer was playing. Uh huh. Uh, you missed that. But uh, I, just, I think I saw it. It was. It looks lit. I'm so stoked. It looks sick. Yeah. But then I'm like, she's she's playing the same character as Charlize. Just this is a prequel, and she is no Charlize. Well, and it's. I don't think it's a thing of better for or worse. It's just they are not. They like. I will have a hard time seeing them as the same character. Exactly. It'll be an entirely different exactly. character. Because like, Charlize is like probably taller than me and can kick me in the fucking head. Yeah. And then Anya Taylor Joy is like eighty pounds. Mm -hmm. She ha she's cool. She has a cool look. She's yeah. she's a she's ferocious a fantastic actor. Her, yeah, but she's just like such a different vibe. Okay, but did you get who she is in this movie? She's Aaliyah in Dune, right? Yeah, yeah. She's supposed to be a grown up Aaliyah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, which but is, she's not going to be Aaliyah in the next one. There's no way. Well, do you, why wouldn't she be? Oh, because Aaliyah won't be grown up. Isn't she like in a Dune? In, isn't she a teenager? In Dune size ten years later. I heard she's gonna, supposed to be like fourteen or something. In yeah, Dune they're gonna Messiah. put her head on a CG baby. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Well, if they didn't have a time jump in this one, will they time jump to her, to like Aaliyah wasn't born in this one and wasn't a toddler. No. So does that mean Aaliyah's ten in the next one, or do they just time jump fourteen years instead of ten so that Aaliyah is the correct age, a teenager? I think they could time jump however much they wanted. They do really. they want. Yeah, yeah. It can be 10 years. It can be 14 and years. I, I think, I mean, it's weird to change the lore, but they could make a a thing of like, if they want to have Timothy Chalamet not a, fake age 10 years, but they want to have it be a, a teenager, they can just be like, oh, the fucking blue shit makes her age faster. No, yeah. don't yeah. do that. Well, I I just want to say, though, even the reason I'm like iffy about it is I thought that she was kind of the bee's knees as an actor. Um, lots of the early shit she was in and, and even including um, Last, Last Night, Night in Soho, Soho. she great. was great but then I saw The Northman which we covered on this podcast Yeah, and she had some like really try hard put on Slavic accent mm. she had this weak like Russian accent the whole time and I, that just ever since then I can just hear her acting since oh. I, saw, I saw the, the gap I, in the uh, armor. I was have you watched The Menu? No she's really good in that oh, okay. I, should, I should get back on the Anya train hmm yeah, I, I don't I, think she's like an all-time great, but she's good. I thought that was a strange. I thought her cameo was strange in this movie for a couple of reasons. One, that she was like a an adult, and I'm like, when that would be a flash forward to like Children of Dune, book three. Well, she's a, a young, she's um, a developed youngster. Uh, <laughs> and second of she all, she has a young look. Second of all, she says like brother. Doesn't she call him brother well, in the vision? Aren't they? Aren't they? It siblings? is a sister. <laughs> His eyes go across. Oh, you know what? You're just getting confused because Paul does have kids in book two. Uh, no, that, sorry, I was confused in that moment because I was like, I I thought for a second that was um, that was not Ga uh, Aaliyah. I thought it was Ganima, who is mm. that's a different character that I won't. Mm -hmm. Can't wait! Can't wait to see Dune Part Three. God dang! Well, um, that's all my nitpicks. Yeah, same. Uh oh, I got a slight hit pick. Uh, big kudos to Denis. Because even though I knew the story, I got worried for Paul in that fight. I was like, because because they had changed a few things, and I'm like, oh, okay, we're deviating from from the book here. I wonder how much they're going to deviate. And uh, the way that that final fight played out with him and Fade Ratha, I was like, are they going to kill Paul? Like, <laughs> My wife said this on the way here, her, like knowing zero. She was other than seeing the first movie. She she actually thought that he might die. Yeah, like anything was possible. It seemed it seemed pretty dire. Yeah, and I'm like, uh, so can he like? So what? Wait, use the force to heal himself. Just to be clear, what happened bit? there? He initially got stabbed in the lower left <clears throat> gut. <clears throat> yeah, and then not a bad stab. Later, wound. gets stabbed in the upper right shoulder. Yeah, but, but he directs when, that one right. So like, he grabs it and he's like 
right. being as How if many... he can't stop it, but then he directs it so but he can get When the... it gets stabbed there, he pulls the blade out of his gut and secretly stabs oh, Fader yeah. Alpha with that yeah. previous weapon. That's my read yeah. of it. That's okay. how I read it, yeah, too. Yeah, was, that was confusing. But but that's why I was a little surprised. It was a good moment. I was surprised that he was stabbed because there wasn't the stabbing noise. You know, the kind of... Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It was so slow. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, last sort of nitpick. Um, oh, okay, wait. Hit pick. Uh, when Jessica is like... Uh, right after she does the water of life thing and she's trying to convince Paul to do it, she's like, open your mind and you will see the beauty and the horror. Oh, and yeah, I, like, cool. I liked how it was like, yeah, it is beauty and horror. It's like, that's the whole, that's Dune, baby. That's the I, I just like that. that oh, I like when he name dropped Dune. Yeah, that was pretty cool. A yeah, Fremen word, Dune. Yeah. That was cool. I didn't see that coming. Although, it's a little, as someone who knows nothing about the lore, it's a little silly because Dune is sand Dune. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're well, just so happy. It's a simple word. It's a simple enough word that you can believe sure. that, like, yeah. duh. Like, yeah. like, you know. And he was like, it was an ancient Fremen word, and Fremen were just descended from, you know, other That's humans. That's Yeah, because yeah. it's like, True. it's year 10,000, she said? Yeah. 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 Uh, what you were what were you saying i've lost my train of thought i'm sorry beauty and the horror yes i like the line that they give before the the water of life ceremony of like you will die but you may see visions Mm -hmm. (laughs) i think that's a that's a fun uh you may see yeah it'll be a fun death yeah (laughs) you were flying pal (laughs) (laughs) you're higher than giraffe pussy <laughs> what? You never heard that? No. <laughs> That's great. That was a I vulgar podcast. Do, yeah. There's no bleeps. I'm sorry, children. Um, well, are we? Mo- it's currently 12:49 a.m. Gotta catch up on life. Yeah, I don't talk to you ever, Riley. That's We're true. Opposite buildings. I know. I've been watching some stuff lately. What you been watching? I finally finished Succession. Did you oh, watch that? Oh, nice. Lauren watched Succession, and I kind of like checked in every once mm. in a while, but I didn't watch it fully with her. Uh, you can't really check in that show, but that was a great show. That was a great a lot of show. Politics, great acting. It's it's similar. It's the kind of movie you or show you pause and you go, did she? Do you think she wanted him to know this? Like, was she mm. being truthful when she said that, or is she lying to herself? No. Like, yeah, there's lots of subtlety in that show. It's hard to get into the best stuff without spoilers, but I want to. Yeah. Oh well. I watched succession? some other stuff too. What do you watch? I watched freaking Basic Instinct. <laughs> <laughs> you know what that is? It's the movie that you know about because there was an extremely beautiful <gasps> woman like crossing her yeah. legs a lot yeah. and uncrossing them. Jamie Lee Curtis? Sharon, Sharon Stone. Stone. Sharon Stone. And it's I didn't know this was a Paul Verhoeven movie. Ah. Uh, like Starship Troopers. That was like the same tone. Yeah. Total Recall and Robocop. And so like it, yeah. It it is a cool, interesting, cool, interesting movie. So okay. it's like it's like earnest and satirical at the same time. It's not like those other movies. It's in not like that, the other movies. that way. It has some like <laughs> crazy <laughs> blood and gore, like where you're like, wow, Paul Verhoeven. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like kind of perfect '90s <laughs> movie. You should check it out. It's, it's an interesting movie, and Sharon Stone is like like level ten charisma, mm. like crazy charisma. Cool. So like we we ended the podcast December 2022 so all of 2023 is basically what we're what we're missing out on here. What did you watch that well, whole time? I'll say Barbie, that like every day for like half the year. Also, there was some crazy Coca stuff going Mountain. on with my apartment. So I like we were living at my parents and Lauren's parents for a while while we like fixed our apartment and stuff. So I didn't. I barely watched any movies that like I, I don't think I watched any movies for the first six months of the year my no. movie watching dropped off hard yeah I yeah. moved to a different city and actually now have a home theater yay you don't care. Riley doesn't care no let's watch a lot of well, it's very yeah, cool I guys say, I don't care I saw it it looks cool it's very cool it's you very got like dark. Little, you got stars David helped me you got I, LED stars I got the- I got v- this is I'm so weird. Okay, I share toilets and I have a velvet room in my house. I put I knew that velvet was the darkest shit. Like if you buy, I bought the blackest paint you can buy, and yeah. it just looks gray beside velvet. <laughs> and I through Creator Warehouse sourced this awesome velvet that I think we're gonna productize in like some sound panels or something. So Dan, the, the Wan Show producer, had this like piece of wood with like seven velvets on it, and we're shining flashlights in different directions, being like, this is the best one. It absorbs the most light from the most directions. This is the best. And I velvet. bought like 800 square feet of it <laughs> and put it on the walls, the ceiling of this entire basement room. It's like a hazard in there. My my sister came over to spend the night for the second time. She brought her own fucking flashlight 
because she can't like with all the lights on in there she can't even go through her bag it's <laughs> there's no reflected light in that room and the, and the you know home theater theory here is that your contrast of your picture is better when there's no like light bounce around in the room oh yeah so it's dark as hell it sounds great i can't wa- wait, wait to watch this movie in there but all that to say i had to do a ton of renos when i moved in and i didn't watch movies for like the mm. podcast ended and i watched like three movies yeah mm. the podcast like a year like you know it was it was nice to be able to watch movies and th- discuss them afterwards but it was also just kind of an excuse to like see movies yeah like uh particularly ones that i sorry wife i'm working <laughs> yeah i gotta work and uh yeah, so it was nice there, and then I didn't have the excuse anymore, so then I just didn't watch movies. Like, I pretty much just saw Barbenheimer and, like, uh, in Spider-Verse 2, and that was pretty much it. Banger. I didn't see Spider-Verse. Fucking I, I, banger. Maybe that's our next one. We do Spider-Man, Spider-Verse 3. Ooh. Um, and we can, we can combine it to a Spider-Verse yeah. 2, 3 mm. combo. I only just managed to watch Spider-Verse 2. Um, you didn't see it in theater? A couple, a couple months ago, yeah. Oh, sorry for you. That was a sick movie, man. Well, it wasn't yeah. on streaming anywhere. For a long time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. still not, I don't, I still, I, I think it's still not on stream. Like you can buy it or rent it or whatever. Yeah. I just canceled Netflix and you. got Disney plus and, uh, they're in anticipation of this new show, X-Men 97, Hell yeah. which is like, <laughs> do you know what that is? Yes. Yeah. So they have I the, they the have trailer. the nineties X-Men cartoon. Now they're like making a new show with the same animation style and spirit. And so they've been kind of promoting it. Like the old X-Men show was on the homepage. Yeah. And I have as an adult watched the whole thing, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think it was like in college. Um, I'm doing it. I've been putting on select episodes. So stoked. I never, Love that show. I never really watched uh, the original X-Men cartoon. Um, like I saw a clip. I, I, I sometimes saw it when it was on TV or whatever, but I didn't really watch it like front to back. Uh, but I also like I saw it occasionally, and I I got the nostalgia from that trailer. It was like, yeah. 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 yeah, it's cool too, because like, and they've updated the animation, but like kept the designs. Like Spider Man and Batman, like Spider Man's just all about his personal life and like his responsibilities and his his two lives, yeah. right? But X Men is about like civil rights, like the pol- like politics, the United yeah. States, uh, like and family eug- eugenics. Can't believe they made it so woke. Genocides, uh. <laughs> like yeah, it's freaking awesome. Yeah, By far X-Men's the most the woke comic <laughs> property yeah since the fucking 60s yeah. but it's also it's like been destroying it, society it's pretty <laughs> edgy man it's pretty edgy i saw a meme going around on facebook it was like that time in the x-men cartoon where charles xavier uh took over magneto's mind and made him relive the holocaust it's like that happens in that cartoon there's like scenes of him in auschwitz like yeah. flashing before him because he's trying to show him this is exactly you've become what you sought to destroy. Professor X would have been canceled for that in 2024. <laughs> it's pretty hardcore, man. It's advanced. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, oh. e- every comic franchise has some weird, wacky yeah. shit like this. When, when they, when you, uh, go ahead. When they go on that long, yeah. Huh? Uh, yeah. I went through a phase where I was watching more movies, um, and then I stopped. And I've watched a ton of TV, actually. I, I usually mm. don't watch that much TV, but I went through Succession. I went through Atlanta. Mm. Absolute banger. I want to watch my favorite. Atlanta. There's so it's good to start, but then once they kind of went off the the chains and started doing weird and like anthology episodes where it's just kind of a weird high concept thing, oh. it becomes fantastic. Oh, um, oh, it becomes good. Oh, so much better. Oh, um, oh. that was great. One Piece. You guys watch One Piece? No, that's Shit, a show. The live action one. Oh, so it's, a, it's an anime. It goes on for like a thousand episodes, but they did, Netflix did a live action. One and I'm I loved it when it came out. It's just very satisfying show. But I'm showing my girlfriend; she's obsessed now. What about Airbender? Uh, I was I was kind of excited for it because it had potential, but it didn't. I heard it's trash. Yeah, so I'm not going to watch it. Yeah. But the biggest thing I I played last year because I played a lot of video games. Final Fantasy 16 is the most a piece of media has affected me in my adult life. Wow. In what way? I there's a mo there's a section of the game. Probably about 30 minutes I was crying. Like, it's like normally when I watch a movie, it's like, you know, a tear, maybe, maybe like, you know, like a, a few, like a couple of tears, 30 minutes of like, <laughs> while the, while the content is playing or was it like, pause it? I'm crying for 30 minutes. No, it's while the content is playing. Yeah, it's, okay. it's a cutscene heavy game. It's very yeah, story yeah, yeah. focused. Um, but there's a part before kind of like the final assault or whatever. And it's just, you're kind of wrapping up a bunch of storylines and it's, um, 
it was something special and the game was absolutely phenomenal but it's not for everybody but uh, the, what yeah. game sorry i can final fantasy 16 wow, you something in my eye <laughs> we're, it's, we're, it's yeah. you're gonna have to listen to the recording pal it's still yeah. there you the, asked yeah. me how iron claw was that oh, wrestling movie yeah, yeah, yeah. and i cried a little bit oh, it wasn't like this experience you're talking about the, but. I've, i mean i've had the real life story spoiled for me so it sounds like it's a pretty fucking miserable movie one it, Zac well, Efron? Yeah. yeah one of us it was a scene that i i would not have been moved if i wasn't a parent it's uh, one of those things like it's it sounds uh i don't know like cheesy but it does after you have kids like so, certain things in movies yeah. like you have a kid and you just become such a bitch <laughs> <laughs> you just care about like you know those kind of storylines yeah, yeah um but yeah final fantasy uh, also final fantasy 7 rebirth came out two days ago fucking banging okay oh, that's part two of the yeah, yeah, whole yeah. retro <laughs> so thing. good i like installed that from the work account and i'm like i'm gonna give it a i'm gonna give it a shot but like i i got to the combat and i'm like oh i don't know about this sure. but wait, should, wait, I, wait. should i push through is it really good are you playing part two or like remake or rebirth no, no, uh, this afterbirth was, this is a while back this oh, is when remake? the first remake i think so i mean i have tons of nostalgia for the story and that's part of the appeal is like you're reliving this in high fidelity yeah but i think they actually did a good job and i think <sighs> the combat is pretty compelling that being said the second one just steps it up and the depth and everything oh, yeah? is it's crazy. This and just the, reminds me. the story, right? Yeah, it's... So, spoilers for Final Fantasy VII Remake. One of the big changes they do in the first one is they have these, like, ghostly figures that appear when your characters are sort of veering off of the path of the original story mm. and you find out that those are the forces of fate and they're trying to channel you down this, this path to make sure that you're, like, fulfilling your destiny. Oh. But the final boss in the first one is fate you fight fate and you kill fate okay and so all of a sudden you, you're you're off the wow. off the chain and you get to do whatever you want and now free will exists and yeah essentially and they show you a <laughs> character that died in one of the spinoffs no longer is dead and that's like a pretty important oh. thing and so the game's this rebirth starts with that character and you're playing as that character <clears throat> and then it but then it cuts back to more of the normal story so it's clear that there's a weird like timeline jump thing happening but it's not clear what it is yet right on but it's fucking. You awesome. just reminded me because a real. If we go way back to like the days where we were carpooling, but we were not even yet carpool critics, The Last of Us Two came out, mm -hmm. and I was like, I'm never gonna play this. And you, ex you guys were playing it, and you explained the whole story to me. And then Last of Us Two came out the, before the, we started the podcast. That doesn't sound right. Maybe well, Last of Us One. We were carpooling anyways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, then the show came out mm -hmm. after the stop. We stopped doing this right. podcast. Yeah. And just I, after, I think. I loved that show. Last it's of Us was a show. sweet show. My yeah. parents watched The Last of Us show. And I thought that was so funny. I was like talking to them about the video game and stuff. And That's they were, hilarious. Because like they, they were not. I've had many conversations with them where I'm like, actually, video games can be art and they can be like really cool and blah, blah. And they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I like videos, you fucking nerd. <laughs> and then I was like, you guys are watching a video game adaptation right now. They're like, yeah, it's really good. I'm like, this is what? Because, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't watch the whole show. Is when I was living at my parents' house. Yeah. So, so I you like, still was, never saw the whole show? No. Um, well, because I played the game. So you know the story. And I saw... That ending, though? Holy yeah. I saw enough of the show... To make me feel like it's it's just a game. Like it, it is. It's very it, it's it stays very close to the game. No and, uh, episode three. Did you see episode three when you're not following Joel and it's got that uh, Nick Offerman. Yeah, yeah. And he, I heard about that episode. Yeah, you should watch that episode. It's a great episode. That, I That's think that I was heard. that was actually the first episode I saw. Oh, because wow. my wife start somehow my wife started watching Last of Us before huh. I got like I wasn't home, and then we went back and it restarted it. But uh, yeah, that is my introduction to the show. I was just like holy shit. I am. I I think they did a really good job capturing the spirit of the show hmm. um is spirit one of the game oh uh, yes spirit of the game and it's one of the few shows i wish there was like one more episode of just developing the relationship a bit more i think they kind of jump from uh hating each other to uh dad and daughter a little too quick hmm. but oh, it's a great show i was pretty fucking happy i can't wait for season two but i have no idea how they're gonna do it like that is a very strange story to translate to tv because half Spoilers for Last of Us 2. Uh, the dude, game. The game. Uh, you only spend half the game as Ellie. Mm -hmm. And you swap characters. And then, like, are they going to have... Are they going to change it so that it's more... Episode intricate? 1 is, Episode one's going to be her, I would think. Ellie? No, the Abby. other girl. You think? Uh, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, so I'm very curious. And they're going to split it over two seasons, that game. Which makes sense. It's a longer game with more stories. Mm. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. It, they're going to Princess Earl on it. 
You need to meet this new character. Kendra's oh, not like a new character who's going to be that important coming well, halfway. you do meet her in the beginning. Oops. But she's kind of like, well, no, that's more spoilers. We don't need spoilers. We spoil don't need spoilers. Yeah, okay. Who I cares? haven't played it and I will play it, but Have I basically know the whole story. heard of this show, Invincible? Yes. I've, yes, I heard of it. It's like an animated The Boys, sort yeah, of. I've watched it. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm up to date. But the the new season, the second half of the second season, have you seen that? Is it Wait, out? Is it out? It's not out yet. It's coming soon. Yeah, very soon. But uh, I've watched the first half. Well, we're bl- we're we're brothers. Heck yeah! <laughs> yeah, that's Let's a go. sweet show. We're vit- vit- vitrimites. I mean, speaking <laughs> of shows that are like the boys, you guys watch the boys? Is it no. still going? Uh, there's a new season coming out. I think it's season three. Came out last year, or two years ago. It's only getting better. Oh man, I really got it. Maybe that's what I should watch now because I never got into two. And two is when it, the show got like got yeah. even better. I thought season one was pretty good. Yeah. But I, you I said that two was dope. I think it, two is better, and then three is even better. There's always moments that Riley would hate that are like, <laughs> like there's a okay, minor spoiler for the first episode of season three. There's a scene where it's like a gay sex scene, and then it's a person that's like Ant Man. He can shrink, and he shrinks and goes inside a penis, and then <laughs> oh. sneezes and goes full size. And oh s- no! Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow, you you called it, David. <laughs> well. I don't know. It's like me hearing that is not going to make me like not watch the show if it's good. So there's a, like, there's a little bit of stuff like that, but then it, who, it who was, hears a description of that is like, yeah, I think it's just it's, <laughs> like, what? It's like horror it's edgy show. I think people don't like being scared. They like the, the thing that happens after you're scared. Riley doesn't like shock value th- kind of no. stuff. Yeah. I, I don't think that borderlines. I don't, I don't like things. That's very shock. I don't like when something feels cheap. Like I don't, I don't like when someone. What if he explodes inside his dick? Yeah, when it when it feels like some when it feels like something has been added to a show to make me go, ugh. You know, if I have a natural reaction to something and it's like, ugh, and I'm not like interrogating the fact that I'm going, ugh, then it's good. Like stuff in Dune, I'm like, ooh, that's gross, and I'm not like thinking that Denis put that in just to make me feel that way. Mm -hmm. It's just it feels natural. But in the boys, from what I, I I think I watched. I watched like eight episodes of season one or something. I might have finished these one. I, it's one. tough. I, I get what you're saying. I think you have to have a tolerance for that kind of humor and shock to get to the stuff that's actually interesting. Like there's a great episode where it's talking about like how you can communicate political messages without specific wording. And it's like mm. kind of actually an intelligent take on how, you know, Trump is getting people to support causes yeah. without outwardly supporting them i've heard people kind of like reference homelander and his mm-hmm. characterization in the later part of the series and how that's like really cool and it, it it is intriguing to me i think that i'm not i'm totally fine with like uh shock value things like that being included i think that the boys particularly the first season had sort of like a low budget feel yeah that makes it more it makes it less immersive it makes me more aware of like the decisions being made it's it's uh shocking i got the first volume of the comic because i was like oh i like the show i'll read the comic it sucks yeah (laughs) it fucking sucks and it's way more it leans way more into the like we're edgy dudes who like killing shit uh and that sucks there is a boys comic it's based on comic and a club it's not mark miller is it i don't know mac miller I'm like how many how many edgy superhero comics has Mark Miller made? Because he did Invincible, I think. Did you Invincible? Kick Ass. Yeah, I like Kick Ass. That's a good shit. Mark Miller. Kick. I've still haven't seen Kick Ass too. Apparently, it's awful. Neither have I. Is that it? I got to pee so bad again. I think we should. I can't uh, keep doing this to my organs. Well, we should wrap it. it up. It's one one a.m. Last last show for me. The Bear. I it's too stressful for me. Really? What is a show? Is it a cooking show? Yeah. Yeah. How much did you watch? I watched probably three episodes and like I liked oh. it. But the anxiety was too real. And oh, I like I, I I didn't mean to stop watching the show. I just needed a break and I just haven't come back to it. So like if you can manage it, it like is it comes out on left field with like uh really fulfilling character arcs that okay. make you cry. Okay. So it's not, it doesn't, it's just when it's like, it feels like I'm working in a kitchen again. I don't like that. (laughs) And it like, it's, it's one of those situations where they put you through, uh, the, the, um, the ringer, the ringer, the, I'm thinking of a different word, but like, um, like dissonance, but filmic dissonance or emotion. No, they like make you stressed and then they They, make you feel better afterwards. I see. Okay. Yeah. 
So it's worth it. It's worth the pain. It's worth it. I've been meaning to watch it because I heard season two was better. And I heard season two was less anxiety driven than the first season. Yes. Uh, Because, yeah, I mean, I won't spoil it. But like, it's a very different vibe. And I don't know how they did it because uh, usually the season two of any show is not as good as the first one. But season two might be better than season one. Hell yeah. One thing I wanted to ask you guys, do you think... Timothée Chalamet is going to get a nomination for Best Actor no, for this movie. I hope not. I don't think he deserves a Best Actor. Well, we don't know what movies he is. I think he did a great job, but I don't think it's that kind of movie. I have a feeling, yeah, that it won't be like Lord of the Rings where they hand out... Because uh, even Lord of the Rings they didn't get Best Pictures. Or they got they got Best Pictures and Best Production Design stuff, but they didn't get Best Actors. Yeah, I don't think they had, like, yeah, actors. And I think those people are more deserving... But yeah, production, I, I, it could totally win like production design. Adapted screenplay, yeah. sound. sound. It'll win both sounds. Direction. I don't know. Yeah, he could, be, he should get best director for that then. Yeah. Fuck yeah. What do you guys think about the Oscars adding a best casting category? Is that, is that happen? I don't know if it's for sure, if it's like a discussion, best but I casting. saw. casting. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I'm not against it because you think about how important the cast is to most movies and like, it's an interesting one because it it's the kind of casting. It's well, the it's kind giving, of, you're trying to, you're trying to you're deciding who to give recognition to that who's in the chain that like yeah. impacts the artwork. And like you think about big franchises, like you think about Harry Potter, and like that deserves a best casting Oscar. Like she found these fucking kids, and they grew yeah. up to be those characters, or uh, like Lord of the Rings, these big franchises where it's like those people are, are perfect. I hope that's more the direction they head than movies like this where they just find the big stars that work yeah the thing that makes yeah me i think wouldn't of i would nominate this person with freaking anya in there you know yeah the thing that makes me think and of though is that Walken. like <laughs> if someone gets snubbed for the best casting it's kind of like it's kind of rude to the actors i don't know that's true you were the wrong choice that's true that's <laughs> i did true. my best yeah all right killers of the Fla- flower moon man dicaprio i don't know Whatever. killers of flower oh yeah, yeah. anyways this That's has been so fun. This it's is fun. sleepy I would time. Do this again. Don't at us being like, guys, just do it every month. You can afford that. That's no. easy for you. It's literally 1 a.m. We knew we were going to do <laughs> Dune since the show was still running. We, were we always, we always knew we were going to come yeah. back for this. But there's no other film that I am like, I mean, Spider-Verse may, maybe. Maybe. Well, like, well, yeah, probably not. Probably not. Dune 3. We'll see you then. Do not hold Dune your Dune three? Yeah, Dune 3. Dune, Dune three. 3 for sure. I mean, That's it'll be Dune 2, though. fucking years. Or will it just be called Dune Messiah? I could they should movie. literally, they should just call it Dune. Uh, National Lampoons. <laughs> they should call it Dune Messiah, I guess. Poon. <laughs> it's a porno ripoff. <laughs> like they had that Pirates of the Caribbean porno. There has to be like a Dune. Yeah. What was the name of the Pirates of the Caribbean one? It's got a booty in it somewhere. I think it was just called Pirates of the Caribbean. Ass Pirates of the... The most genius writing was the, the Paris Hilton sex tape, A Night in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh. and with that, that... Thank you so much <laughs> for being here, everybody. And thanks uh, to Manscaped. Just joking. No. No. We weren't sponsored. Love ya. Missed ya. Did we have a sign-off? Did we used to have a sign-off? I don't remember. I would say... I, I, I used Bye. to say love ya at the end. I used to say love ya. Love you so much. Subscribe to They're Just Movies. <laughs> <laughs> For no reason.